OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Yes, indeed. You're very welcome along this Thursday morning, I want to say. Is it a Thursday, Owen? Tell me if I'm right or not. 50-50? I would be 70% sure it's Thursday. Mm -hmm. So we, I think you're there. Thursday, the 25th of February uh, in the year 2021. You're welcome along to OTB AM. And we have, funny enough, got plenty to talk about on the show this morning because it is Cardiff's world. Big Mick is the greatest manager in the history of football and we are just living in it. What the hell? It, of all the things that happened in the pandemic... Mick McCarthy winning six games in a row. I mean, maybe he's won six games in a row before. I don't know. Maybe, but I'm not sure. This might be the best winning run of his entire life. Uh, Cardiff are suddenly in the uh, playoff spots. They beat Bournemouth last night. Shane Long scored for Bournemouth, by the way. So it was a brilliant news all round for Ireland. Where was this big Mick when he was in charge of us? Mm, it, it, it turns out that the football culture of Nicosia is a little bit different to the football culture of Cardiff. Uh, like Mick has come and put his big, very noticeable footprint on this football club. And uh, that footprint has clearly just led to a lot of success immediately. It is almost like Roy Keane at Sunderland all those years ago, taking a team from the lower reaches of the championship and making them look like immediate promotion contenders. And they're in the playoff mix right now. Vincent Tan is a stan of Mick McCarthy at this point, I think it's fair to say. He loves the guy. And Cardiff, uh, once fans get back, I think that they're going to have a victory parade and hold Mick McCarthy shoulder high as they parade through the city, whatever. I, I was going to like name a monument in Cardiff there, but I don't know any monuments except for the Principality Stadium. Is, is Twin Town a part of it? What, what, what was that reference in the name of the movie? Was that Anyway, look, uh, some, somebody out there has been to Cardiff more than like from Bristol Airport to the uh, rugby stadium and back, and will tell us something about its many magnificent sights and sounds and the, it's a beautiful place that it is. And fair play, he's doing his bit for uh, Irish Welsh relations, which were, as we know, at an all time low. Uh, he certainly is. Uh, and like, uh, it's funny when you look at what people have said about Mick McCarthy. This isn't some sort of flash in the pan. This is the authentic version of Mick McCarthy that has come in and it's worked and fair play to the guy for doing it. Like there is quotes by one of his midfielders, Will Vox, that's carried in a lot of the papers this morning. And he just paints a picture of their first meeting. He says, there was no big long speech. It was just, listen, I'm here to try and improve you. I know how good you are. I want to get the best out of you. It was 30 seconds of introduction and let's get on the pitch and improve. This no nonsense approach doesn't work everywhere. Didn't work in Cyprus, possibly didn't work in the Republic of Ireland but it seems to be working immediately in Cardiff. He says, this is Vox again, he says, we are horrible to play against, we are physical, we run further than other teams, we win our battles, but we also have quality now. That, that is a hallmark of Mick McCarthy. Now, the question I had is, does Mick McCarthy himself believe the hype around Mick McCarthy? Is, is, does he believe that he is going to do this thing? And I think he does. I really think he does, because he was speaking about the age profile and the experience of some of the managers in the championship at the moment. You've got Neil Warnock in the championship at the moment. You've got uh, Nigel Pearson about to take a job in the championship. This is a tough man's league right now. And Nick McCarthy has been strengthened by the belief that Nigel Pearson and Neil Warnock are his contemporaries once again. So he talks about vacancies and he says, maybe people are having a look at seeing our results here and think, well, maybe these experienced guys do know something about what they're doing and do have a role to play. All I hear whenever a job comes up is that it's got to be some young guy with bright new ideas. And you know what? There's not that many new ideas that come around in football. It's still kind of the same. Keep it off the opposition and put it in their net and get it back. Well, guess what? Cardiff City are getting the ball back and putting it in the opposition net. Cross it! Mick McCarthy has risen from the dead. Cross it! Get the cross in! Cross it! There's nothing new. I mean, in fairness, no, <laughs> things have definitely not changed from the three at the back against Iceland that time that Roy Keane was a, an, an unused centre-back, essentially, in that match. And then we played 4-4-2 a good bit where I suppose Damien Duff was a false nine without us even knowing it because he obviously was not an out-and-out -out striker and he was a world-class winger at that point. But we, we couldn't find a way to get him in the team. So, look, sure, I mean, fair play to him. It's an incredible story. I wish them all the best and uh, congratulations. We should talk about the Ireland team for the game this weekend against Italy. What would you do if you suddenly were reading the papers and seeing everybody calling for essentially you to be sacked at the end of this campaign because we're getting to that point now where if we don't sack him now, it'll be too late to sack him. Uh, would you pick your best team or would you go all experimental and put the kids in against Italy this weekend? 
Yeah, nice uh, rhetorical question there. I think we all know the motives why it's going to be a pretty strong team this week. And like, like uh, maybe it wasn't a rhetorical question. Well, let me let me let me let me finish it then. So l let me put you in the shoes. Say you're a columnist for a national newspaper as opposed to a local newspaper, which you obviously are. I haven't seen your column this week, and I apologise if you were calling for the head of Andy Farrell already. <laughs> uh, but um, would you then like? Having called him for his head last week, would you then berate him for not picking the kids this week? I'd say you probably would, because that's how you make your money. Mm, possibly. Like, I mean, there, there, is, um, there, there is a case to be made here that if you want to keep your job and you're worried about it, then you can at least throw in the kids, because at that's what certain columnists are calling for. That's what everybody's calling for. And all of a sudden, it's not your fault. It's 20-year-old, whoever it may be's fault. That, that, like, that's a good way of shifting pressure. Yeah, I... I this, in my head, there's this um, there's a period where we introduced a bunch of young players. It might have been that team that Rob Saunders and Simon Gagan were on, and they lost every game, but they played really exciting rugby, and they kind of they were really good to watch, and they had cool jerseys. But I'm pretty sure that management team got uh, fecked out pretty quickly. I I need to go back and just check exactly. I'm sure it's in Brendan Fanning's book. Um, but uh, the the uh, the walls of the IRFU are festooned with pictures of ex coaches who didn't last long, who picked the kids. And uh, so that's why the teams that have been leaked to the papers, interestingly, the teams that have been leaked to the papers are different. Uh, these are possible teams in the Irish Times and possible teams in the Irish Independent. There is consensus on a bunch of things that you would expect. So Hugo Keenan's going to start, Ring Rose and Henshaw in the centre. Jameson Gibson Park is named in both Keen Tracy's piece and Jerry Thorny's piece as the scrum half, with the caveat that if Murray is fit, uh, he'll either be on the bench or uh, Craig Casey will be. So there's, I think there's still a little bit of doubt about whether or not Craig Casey's going to make the bench, or perhaps if Murray's fit, maybe he starts, I don't know. James Lowe is safe, but Keith Earl slash Jordan Larmer, and it's Jordan Larmer getting the start in Keane Tracy's piece. That's where the first um, bit of change between them. Then the front rows, Dave Kilcoyne is back. Was Kilcoyne completely injured? Is that why he wasn't in the squad for the France game? I didn't see any confirmation of that. I can't see it in the, in the press conference as well. Um, we could have done with him last week, obviously. He must have been injured because he's playing really well at the moment. And they're starting him. Ronan Kelleher starts and Tyke Furlong starts. And that's what both teams have. That is in agreement. <clears throat> so whoever's leaking to the papers, whatever they've seen in uh, training, they uh, the same things are there. But all of a sudden it gets very interesting. Ian Henderson's going to start. You'd think they obviously have a lot of time for Ian Henderson given he was the one that they turned to to captain the sides. So you've got Henderson and James Ryan... Henderson and James Ryan. And then Ty Byrne is at six, which is interesting. Mm. They've obviously decided we, we'd like to cut your jib enough to stick you in the team. Will Connor starts for Jerry Thornley, and Josh Van der Fleer starts for Keen Tracy, and then CJ Stander is at eight. Uh, interestingly, there's a bench with, with Thornley's piece. Ryan Baird starts on the bench, which obviously would suggest he'll make his, uh, his debut. Jack Conan is on the bench. Billy Burns makes it, so he is officially the uh, second choice behind Sexton. Uh, it's Herring, Healy and Porter. So the team that would have started the, in the front row is, is going to be on the back. So that's that, our front row, first choice, for second choice. Let's, let's see what happens here. I don't think anybody would be disappointed to see a starting front row of Kilcoyne, Kelleher and Furlong. What do you make of those teams? Well, this is, like, it's not the top line, but what, the first thing that kind of sticks out to me here is that Billy Burns gets another chance because Johnny Sexton's not going to play 80 minutes. There might be early substitutes made if the game is done early. So Billy Burns is going to get a fair amount of time at out half. You look at his halfback partner on Jerry Thornley's bench, for example, it's going to be Craig Casey. Depends who he's going to be back up to, but it makes perfect sense for Craig Casey to be your replacement scrum half in a game against Italy. That is the ideal scenario for you to make your debut. From the start against Italy is fine, but coming off the bench against Italy is even better again. What, what a great place uh, to come in and, and start making inroads in, in your Ireland career. So that's the first thing that sticks out to me, that those people who were hoping that Billy Burns and Ross Byrne would be dropped down the pecking order for Carty or even one of the young kids to be brought in, they might be even more angry this morning because there might have been that chance for that to happen. I like Burn at six. Like I, I know it's something, I'm not sure what you think about it, but I really like that idea. I think that Henderson and Ryan are going to be very hard to shift in the second row, and you've got this player who's playing the rugby of his life and one of Ireland's best players this season, at least at club level, and has been good so far in the Six Nations. I think that I really want to see him at six anyway, and I think it's a, it's a really exciting move from them to, to try that out. Like I think it's really harsh on potentially Reese Rodock and Josh van der Fleer, 
uh, in the Irish Times, neither of them are in the squad. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're being rested for the last two games, or is this it yeah. now? You get out of this squad, the team wins, you get a, get a bit of confidence, and it's like, look, I know it looked like we were resting you for the big games to come, but actually, that team just won. So we're sticking with it, because mm. they've got confidence. Uh, yeah, maybe. You look at the rest of the team, and it looks pretty strong. There isn't much resting experimentation. But no. <laughs> yeah, no, there isn't. Like, in, in fairness, now, Sexton didn't play the last day, so maybe they feel they actually need to play, get him into form, get him an hour on the pitch, and he'll be ready to go for two big games to finish off the Six Nations. Uh, the questions then are regarding the backs, and all of a sudden it feels very threadbare in terms of depth at the back. Uh, like, uh, Keith Earls would probably feel a little bit unfortunate to be dropped because... There's one way to play yourself into form, and it's playing against Italy. Uh, I realise that everything I've said about Italy this morning, like given our track record on the show, is going to blow up in our face. And like uh, ItalyOnline.com is uh, sca- scavenging. Say something right good now. so we can have a beef with Italy. That'd be good. We, we could do with a little beef. I mean, they've got much better food than I, I love Italian rugby culture. When they before they moved to the Stadio Olimpico, the stadium was this kind of rambunctious falling down where they would bring beer to your seats, and if it was the last game, it was just about getting warm in Rome. And we always won, and they didn't really care. It was amazing. It was like, it's by far the best trip. And if, if this whole thing about, oh, we need to give Georgia versus Italy, no, 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 no. We've got to keep Italy because it's the best place to go. And if that's the reason why they're in it, that's as good as any reason. Like, like come on. Let's move on. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Phil Egan, good morning to you. Good morning, how are you doing, lads? Yeah, we're pretty good. We're uh, looking at the suggested Ireland team for the weekend and uh, I think we're going to win that game. There's going to be a forward struggle for 40, 45 minutes and we'll score a few tries between the 45th and 55th, 60th minute and then all the subs will be made and the game will peter out and it'll be a bonus point win for Ireland by 20 to 25 points. And we're back then. I wouldn't say we're back exactly. I don't think that we're going to be back until... Uh, we're, we start playing some fluid rugby, but you could see us. You can see us winning the last three games. You can see us beating Italy and losing the last two games. Any of these various outcomes are on the table at the moment. Absolutely. I just want to put a case for, by the way, for Tbilisi. It's a lovely, lovely city. I've been there a couple of times. So, if Georgia do end up in the Six Nations, Tbilisi is definitely a good trip. Is it? It's, it's a long. It's a long one. It's a tough one. Right. Uh, but when you get there. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot cheaper than Rome. That's all I'm saying. Uh, okay, it's a lot cheaper. Is it like old Eastern Bloc kind of... Uh... No, like, so I've, obviously I went, the, the first time I went was 2014. So Martin O'Neill's first competitive game, the Geedy one. Oh, then, yeah. then the last campaign for Martin O'Neill, well, the last uh, qualification campaign before he, he obviously did the Nations League, but the, the one-all draw. And I, you could see that the even in the few years that I've been away, like the they definitely there was a few cranes there and the, the place looked a lot better. But both games were kind of around September as well, so the weather was beautiful. It was like late twenties, and um, yeah, really, really cheap. Why do you think? Why do you think Aidan McGeady didn't make it? Um, I, I, I I don't know. I mean that like that that's one of the greatest goals you'll ever see. I remember it was, I think it was the first away trip I ever did for Ireland and you're kind of getting your, the tone of your report ready and it's like, ah, oh, disappointing start for Martin O'Neill, a one-all draw in Georgia and then McGeady pops up with that. It was unbelievable. Look, he was always gifted player technically, but um, yeah, that, that, uh, that first season he had with Everton, it looked like he was going to kick on, but it never really happened. And now he's, he's, he's back playing really well, but just not at the level that we, we, we would have expected. We thought he'd, he'd still be playing at the, not the very highest level, but championship at, at least, but he's obviously down a level. But yeah, I, I, he's had an interesting career, obviously the, the trip to Russia as well. Yeah, he's still only 34. He's not, yeah. th- not 35 until uh, this April, so he's nearly 35 in fairness. Phil, what's going on in the world? There are some stories that we need to get to. Yeah, well, obviously Manchester City were in Champions League action last night. We, there is a lot of talk of this quadruple. I mean, it's fair to say they're going to win the Premier League, the, the League Cup final against Spurs. Look forward to them in, in April. They've obviously beaten Spurs recent enough. They've, the FA Cup quarterfinals. This is the one they want, though. The Champions League. This is why Pep was brought in, and it was a comfortable night for them. Two 0 win against Borussia Mönchengladbach. That was the away leg of the tie. I played at a neutral venue, 
and it's uh, yeah, pretty much done and dusted. There, it's going to be in the quarterfinals. The goals coming from um, Bernardo Silva, and Gabriel Jesus. Interesting, Joe Cancelo playing that ball into the box and and finding Bernardo Silva twice. Obviously, the first was a goal, the second was an assist, but. Real Madrid beat 10-man Atalanta 1-0. That game was in Italy and um, really fancied Atalanta to win this one, but the red card changed everything and still wouldn't write Atalanta out of the the, the second leg, but um, certainly Real Madrid would have been delighted to come away with a win in that one. Manchester United, Arsenal, Leicester and Rangers all in Europa League action this evening. All will be looking to join Tottenham in the last 16 of the competition. Spurs beat Wolfsburg 4-0 last night, 8-1 on aggregate. Deli Ali with the pick of the goals. Olivier Giroud did it on Tuesday. Deli Ali's overhead was a little bit different, but a, a great goal. United have a 4 0 lead over Real Sociedad from last week's first leg. One all between Arsenal and Benfica. Arsenal have an away goal. Nil all between Leicester and Slavia Prague. Leicester at home this evening. And Rangers have a 4 3 advantage over Royal Antwerp. Cardiff and Mick McCarthy, they're going to the Premier League. He just can't stop them. Six wins in a row under Mick McCarthy. They beat Bournemouth, who were sixth, but they've replaced Bournemouth now. The 2-1 win last night. They're into the playoff places. If only Cardiff had hired Mick earlier, they'd probably be top of the league. They'd probably have won the championship by now. But, um, yeah, still a bit to go. And uh, looking good, though. Six wins, two draws. So they drew their first two games under Mick, and they've won six. And um, maybe that time in Cyprus really served them well. But a bit of, but it, it does help Cardiff have a really good team. Harry Wilson... The on loan Liverpool player is uh, key to that. But actually, speaking of Liverpool, some really sad news coming from Brazil this morning. And this involves the father of Liverpool goalkeeper Alison Becker, Jose Becker, who has been found dead in Brazil. His body was found late last night after a swimming accident in a lake near his holiday home. Now, please say no, no foul play at all. But um, yeah, desperate news for. Um, the Liverpool goalkeeper, Alison Becker. You mentioned the, the Ireland rugby team there. Ronald Kelleher set to earn his first Six Nations start when Andy Farrell names that team to face Italy later on today. We'll also see the names of James Ryan and Johnny Sexton in the starting 15, both missed the game against France. Rory McIlroy and Shane Larry are in the field for the WGC Workday Championship. That starts in Florida today. Porter County will play at the Puerto Rico Open. And Willie Mullins has led the tribute to trainer Tom Foley, who passed away yesterday, age 74, the Carlo native saddled Denoli to victory in the novices hurdle at Cheltenham in 1994. We'll talk about that with Tom Lone uh, a little bit later on in the show and also the news that Patrick Mullins is considering turning professional so that he'll be able to ride at this year's Cheltenham Festival. They're not going to allow amateurs to ride or compete in the festival and we'll talk about uh, Patrick Mullins' options about that in our countdown to Cheltenham which is coming a little bit later on. You did, um, you watched that City game last night. Uh, yeah. How has João Cancelo become somebody who suddenly everybody's like, wow, this guy's really good, compared to last season where it was like, is he in the team? Not really. Is he a f why aren't they playing this man they've spent 50 million on at fullback? This seems like a bit of a bust. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, what? where is he playing? Yeah, he's playing that, that Philip Lam role where he'll just drift into midfield. And obviously it works both ways. He's obviously right-footed, but if he plays on the left like he was last night. He can drift in and... The, the crosses that he puts in, they're in swingers, but also as well that you have to take into account last season, Liverpool or sorry, Manchester City's defence of their Premier League title and their defence in general was not very good. Ruben Diaz has come in and he's just shored the whole thing up. I mean, you play beside Ruben Diaz, if you do anything good, you get a fist pump from Ruben Diaz. And last night it was Emmerich Laporte, John Stones was on the bench. And it was a comfortable one. Now, there was a few times, and Pep Guardiola talked about it after the game, they weren't clinical enough. And you just wonder, it's so comfortable at the moment. For yeah. That's 19 wins in a row in all competitions. Is it too, is it it's, too easy? It's like Bayern Munich when before they got good enough to win the Champions League. That's what you're, that's yeah. what you're getting at here, isn't it? it? They could just go, get done with a sucker punch. There was times last night where it, when Gladbach played out and they got through the press, but they just weren't good enough for that final ball. But a better team would actually punish them. And I just wonder, you know, when they when they get to the latter stages of the competition, will the pressure be ramped up a bit? Now, it definitely will help City, the fact that there's no fans there. And I, I think they play these games, they, they look like training games. City's games are just so straightforward. Now, the other teams just can't get near them. Can't put... Ederson basically could sit there with a deck chair and might have to make one or two saves. But uh, 
yeah, it's all looking very comfortable. Yeah. I think probably the most controversial thing about City's game last night was Pep's jacket. Yeah, we can talk about that a little bit later on. Phil, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, uh, I don't know even if it's for sale in the club shop. We're not sure. It's 7.50 this morning here on OTB AM. Um, I'm going to tell you what's coming up on the show between now and 10 o'clock. We're going to speak with Martin Lipton in just one second. Stephen Ferris is standing by to talk to us about the, the team, the back row selection and the makeup and the balance of the game for the Italy match. We'll hear from Ian Henderson on Ireland-Italy. Armagh footballer Amy Mackin has talked to us about her incredible season. Golf and sports news with John Duggan. We've got our Cheltenham countdown with Tom Malone. We've got TV picks with Sue Murphy and we're remembering Gary Halpin at 9.35 this morning. Now, Martin Lipton, good morning to you. How are you? We'll get to him in one second, just uh, lining up the shot there. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about Spurs. It was uh, relatively straightforward for Spurs in, uh, in, in, in terms of the results. It hasn't been straightforward in terms of team selection over the last while, Owen. This has been... Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to read the runes so uh, Bale didn't start last night but played well off the bench against West Ham scored when he came off the bench last night does this mean he's going to start at the weekend? I'm not sure Martin Lipton, good morning to you, how are you? I'm okay actually Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> for the first time in a while um, <laughs> If my life were determined by the results of Tottenham Hotspur it would be truly miserable so thankfully it isn't <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about what is actually happening at Spurs at the moment it's very difficult to know um, the result last night was was excellent, and um, and that competition is going to be very important if if we're going to see a, another act of Jose Mourinho at Spurs. What's your instinct at the moment about how long Mourinho is going to last? Uh, I think, like the consequences of the French Revolution, it's far too early to say. Um, but nevertheless, uh, they weren't great. Again, it was a reserve team, and they won the game. So let's be honest; it was no big deal. They were playing a load of rubbish. Nevertheless, the performance was improved. I actually thought they played pretty well in the second half against West Ham and probably should have won the game from 2-0 down because they, they battered them senseless. But there's obviously concerns about where it goes. And Mourinho's fate will be determined uh, by a, a, a variety of factors. One is the fact that it costs £30 million to sack him. Uh, and if there's a guarantee that fans will be back next season, it'll be a lot easier to afford sacking him when they earn £6 million from a home game. Uh, if fans aren't going to be back in big numbers, then it makes it a lot harder. But also, it will be based on how this season finishes. If they were to uh, win the Europa League and get into the Champions League, uh, absolutely no doubt that these days, another season. If they get knocked out in the next round, um, lose the League Cup final and finish... 10th, I suspect they'll find a way to get rid. Yeah. Uh, the the stories that are coming out at the moment about the the relationship he has with the players, how much credence do you give those? Because obviously when results are bad, some players are going to be annoyed and no doubt they'll tell their agents, the agents talk to people. These stories exist in, in almost every changing room where the team isn't top of the table. Um, and yet... With Mourinho, there obviously has been a, a pattern where there are certain players who have been unhappy, big big name players who have been unhappy at all the clubs that he's gone to. So I, I, I can't tell whether or not this is that important or if this is par for the course or if this is actually something that we should be paying a lot of attention to. I read a piece in another newspaper the other day saying that um, Mourinho's treatment of Danny Rose was proof why he was never fit to be Tottenham manager. Tottenham have wanted Danny Rose out of the club for three years. So it's an absolute nonsense. I'm sorry, it's utter rubbish. Simple as that. Now, has he had fallouts with other players? Unquestionably. I think that uh, um, there will be issues. His relationship with, with Bale and, and Deli Alli has been clearly uh, strained at best, although it appears to be rather better now, maybe through necessity, but nevertheless, necessity can be the, of invention. So he had a bit of a fallout with Matt Doherty, I'm sure he has, because Matt Doughty has not performed. Let's be honest, he's been pretty awful. You know, uh, even his most, you know, the most positive mark out of 10 for Matt Doughty would be six, and I suspect it's nearer five. So he's been let down, he will feel, by certain players. The trouble is the defence isn't good enough. And you can have the most beautiful um, cathedral in the world constructed, but if the foundations are rubbish, it will fall down, and lo and behold... Tottenham are falling down on a regular basis because they can't kick the ball out of their own net. There are always stories at clubs that aren't doing well about about the manager. 
that's what players and agents do. I always take them with a pinch of salt. If he has a fallout with Son and Kane, that's a different matter. Thus far, at least, those two in particular appear to be in the Mourinho camp. It's interesting because some of the reports that you read suggest that they want the Pochettino level of work back that they feel that they're being undertrained at some level, which kind of leads you to have a limited degree of sympathy for the players, considering being overworked might have been one of the reasons why they were unhappy with Maurizio Pochettino before he was sacked. They're just, it's excuse making. They, they, these were the same moments where all the training was far too hard, it needed to be softer. Mourinho doesn't let players go easy. He's not a madman, but he doesn't give, it, give them nothing in training. He makes them work very hard. So, again, I... I if you if the if you want to cr- criticise the performance, the inertia, the stasis in the way that they played in too many matches, I'll listen to that. If you want to moan about training, I'm not interested. One positive note that might be gleaned from the last little while. There's been a couple of positive notes to be fair, Martin. And like I, I know you said, they're up against a pile of rubbish last night. Wolfsburg are still third in Bundesliga. They're ahead of Dortmund. It's not a terrible team. And to come away no, with... No, that's, Wolf, that's Wolfsburg, not Wolfsburger. Sorry, well, well, sorry, my apologies. Uh, <laughs> my, my apologies. The player, the player uh, the sixth in Austria. Now, let's put it in perspective. <laughs> my apologies. That, that's a complete brain part of my part, uh, Martin. My, my <laughs> we can fix it in post, don't worry. <laughs> no, you, you absolutely can. Uh, the, but the, the 8-1 scoreline... Martin, surely you can take a positive from that. Surely De- Deli Ali scoring a bicycle kick against me is uh, is a positive thing in, in a competitive game. Oh, no, it was it was much better, and they they battered them in both games. I mean, the first leg they were three up at half time, and if they really wanted to, could have won by by you know five, six, seven, eight, whatever. And again last night with the reserve team, they won easily. And Delhi played very well. Even the big centre forward who can't chuff a bag of cement scored twice. Um, great, you know, and he put a lot of kids in and there's good mood music but they've got to back it up on Sunday against Burnley and then next Thursday against Palace and then the following Sunday against uh, Fulham rather, and the following Sunday against Palace and then the first leg of the last 16 and then Arsenal and then the second leg, and it's like so many games that are coming, but they have, one-off performances against a pretty ordinary side aren't enough, it's got to be back-to-back performances with a consistent team that's defending properly and, and playing as it can. Now, I think if you go with the front three, watching him the last couple of games of, of Bale, Son and Kane, you've got a chance uh, because Bale's starting to look like Bale, isn't he? I mean, I would say that Son's slightly off form at the moment, but we can live with that. Kane could have scored five on Sunday. Uh, if he gets those chances again, they'll go in. So, theoretically, they can start to look like a football team again, which they haven't done for much of the last month. Why have they been conceding so many goals? Is it the centre-back partnership? Is it the defensive screen from midfield? It, it's a very un mourinho like thing to be happening. We know he wanted to bring in Scrinio and ideally another at centre-half uh, over the summer into the transfer window. Couldn't do it. Uh, Roden came in and has been in and out of the team. I think he's got a, a future, actually. I'm quite impressed with him. They aren't good enough. The full-backs don't. Uh, on the right, particularly, he hasn't got a right back he trusts. regulon has been out injured. He's a massive part for him. One of the things about Regulon, because he's so quick and gets forward, the opposing team are less keen to get at, at Tottenham on that flank because if they lose the ball, they're going to get hurt on the counter. Without him, and Ben Davies is a very player, but he's not going to strike fear in anybody, is he? Let's be brutally honest. So things like that, the fact that the best centre-half isn't, uh, as young as he was, and he's starting to look immobile. Uh, Dye makes it the odd mistake. Um, Sanchez, I've never been sold on in the three and a half, four years he's been at the club. And Luis is decent, but he's prone to a few errors, and every mistake he's made recently has cost a goal. But all season they were conceding soft goals from set pieces. In fact, ever since Mourinho went there, they've conceded too many goals from set pieces, too many goals from simple crosses. Um, it's been a pattern for more than a year. That's coaching, right? Like, I know I know, we can blame the players for complaining about stuff, but set pieces, you assume, good quality coaching and, again, very un mourinho like Because so, he, he was saying he's still the best coach in the world. But if your team is conceding set pieces consistently, then you're not. Well, he's, but these are the defenders who make the same mistakes regularly. That's the problem. It's the same. He's, they're making basic errors, which, which are concentration errors 
uh, really sloppy go goals. And I don't know quite why that can happen. I think it, it seems bizarre that they don't learn. The inability to learn is the thing that scares me because I think you'd have thought by now this level of football, you'd work out where you need to be positionally. But they're, ugh, I, I think it's a, it's a lack of confidence more than anything else. They lose faith in themselves. And you know what footballers are. It's, the game is played between the ears more than anywhere else. And once you start making the errors, it's hard to get out of that mindset. You, you become nervous, you become hesitant, you you you, you attack the ball with less intensity because you're scared of miss of having to make up for your mistake. Um, so I don't know what the answer is. I think the answer sometimes is just a clear out of players and new ones who aren't burdened by uh, muscle memory of failures past. So it, it sounds like you are relatively confident that with with a bit of a clear out that actually the bones of a really good Spurs team is here and that Mourinho still has it, whatever it is, at the club. And that there is, there's, a, there's a pathway for this to work, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. There is a path, but it has to work with results. And if, it, if results aren't there, it would be very difficult. The, he's very fortunate the fans aren't in because there would have been a, a degree of negativity rushing around, in particular the last few weeks when those performances, I think the Chelsea game, Brighton, uh, just simply appalling, unacceptable uh, level of performance, level of intensity. Now, with, with fans in the stadium, he'd not, he would not have got away with that, and he has. Um, so he's been bought time by circumstances which are entirely out with his control. Um, but Daniel Levy and the board cannot afford Spurs to not be in Europe. Uh, if they're not in Europe, someone will take the blame, and that will be the manager. Uh, so he knows that as well. But I said, if they were to do what is still possible, then everything changes and the mood music is completely different. So it's, it will be entirely dependent uh, upon what happens between now and, and the end of May. What, what would the trigger be for Harry Kane to decide he's had enough? Is, is European qualification enough to keep him there? Is, is not qualifying for Europe enough of a trigger to say, look, lads, I gave, it my, I gave it my best. I've given you my best years. The only fair thing for all of us here is for you to sell me to whoever wants to buy me. Four years left on a six years contract. Spurs won't sell to another English club. Uh, and they won't sell for less than 200 million pounds. Who has got 200 million pounds in the current market? Only maybe PSG if they're forced to sell Mbappe, but then they obviously are selling Mbappe because they want to buy Messi. Do you really like... want to go and play in, in France? Probably not. If he wants to, you know, you've got to choose your league. You want, you want to play uh, look, if Lewandowski disappears and Bayern Munich come in, I can see him wanting to go there, for example, um, because they're a great team and they could do, uh, you know, uh, he would be the ideal Lewandowski replacement. I, I think probably even a better replacement. He wouldn't quite maybe score as many goals, though with the chances they create, he might, but he'd create loads as well. Um, but there aren't that many clubs who've got the money anymore. We know that Barcelona and Real Madrid are really struggling financially you know billion pounds in debt um money's too tight to mention and that becomes an issue and, and i suppose that those circumstances go on on sorry it, it sounds martin as if there's like a few tangible fixes that you can see defensively being one of them where spurs can actually get a realistic avenue towards the champions league via the europa league this year it, it sounds like you would give them a chance against a team who are third in bundesliga if they can get their defense together over the next few weeks I think they've scored goals against anybody. We've seen that. I mean, I was, I, despite the fact they got beat uh, because they defended poorly on Sunday, if you can't watch that second half and not think, how did they lose it? Because what was it, four or five balls rolled across the six yard box with no one getting a touch, two shots from Kane that were a faction wide, two against the woodwork, and it will be one of them was ridiculously fortunate and a fluke. But, you know, the construction of the, pl of the chances was that of a team that's looking as if it can score goals against anyone, which I hadn't seen since before Christmas. I Probably not since the Manchester United game at the, at the beginning of October. So you watched that and you thought, oh, yeah, there's a, there's a team there. Now, if that gels for a, a period of time, if he now goes, I don't say he will, but Hoberg and, and John Blee as the central two and Delhi in behind the front three, that spells fear for any side. But then again, when you've got to score four to guarantee a draw, it's a lot harder. One last thing, I wanted to talk about your story in the back of the sun today. Um, there's a potential that we might have a Champions League final in New York, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. 
Look, I mean, this is it was it's just, this was actually first mooted by Alexander Sefkin soon after he uh, took over in 2016. Uh, but my understanding, I'm I'm told, is that the um, as we know, the next UEFA contract, the next uh, model, they looked at they're looking to, to fix it for nine years, from 2024 to 2033. Uh, and that the suggestion I've been told uh, is that sponsors, potential sponsors, have installed the possibility prospect of finals, not every final, but finals uh, in New York uh, on the East Coast of the US. Now, a 3 p.m. kickoff in in New York on a Saturday afternoon is 8 p.m. UK, 9 p.m. Europe. So it works for that uh, for the for all markets in that regard. Um, and it's all about finding a way for UEFA to get more money in the bank. They need to be able to show that the, the money, that the competition is lucrative because the clubs are in need of demanding extra cash. The clubs appear to be very close to trying to come up with a radical solution to their billion euro debt problem by perhaps accelerating the whole notion of a, a breakaway league. For the last 20 years, they've been talking about, uh, ever since the G14 was a, a football version of Bilderberg, uh, they've been hinting at this possibility. It was only ever, it seemed like a, a threat. For the first time in a long time, it seems like it's a realistic possibility. Well, look, the, this plan by Real Madrid, United, Liverpool and uh, AC Milan is real, but it does appear that you I think they've headed it off by uh, recreating the Champions League into this 36-team Swiss model league system um we'll see uh, that, that there are issues within various leagues within uh, the european league group within the premier league but they're tinkering around the edges the basic concept appears agreed accepted by uefa and the eca and that's what matters if you get the eca clubs to sign up including real madrid and manchester united who are on the steering board uh, of the eca then it's difficult for them to join something else and that's what UEFA's position is they're trying to push this through swiftly by April uh, even earlier if they can so it can be uh, agreed at the at the Congress um, in April uh, and, and then it's fixed and once the plan's out there and agreed it's, it becomes the winner because it's difficult to see it overturned in favour of something else so there's still issues and there's still a possibility of this JP Morgan backed 6 billion euro Super League but I think if UEFA get their plan agreed, that will, if not kill it off, it will make it harder for that to become real. All right, really interesting couple of months ahead of us all on the, on the European football politics front. Martin, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Cheers. Bye bye. Martin Lipton from The Sun there. You can read his story about the, uh, the big cup going to the Big Apple. Uh, right, it's eight minutes past eight this morning. Uh, a few comments coming through. We'll get to uh, Stephen Ferris in a moment as well. Stephen Somerville says, I remember the last time we lost against Italy was eight years ago and it wasn't nice and we ended up sacking Kidney. If this were to happen on Saturday, then it's time up for Farrell, clearly. Wayne Ryan says, lads, I don't understand all this. They have to win and then maybe experiment with the Scotland game. It's a manager's job on the line. If it was your job, wouldn't you go with guys you trust, win or lose? Yeah, and look, the money. His, his job is to make money for the IRFU and the job of all the head coaches has always been to make money for the IRFU over the course of the um, Six Nations. And then by the time we get to the World Cup, we're like, we made all that money, what are we going to do in the World Cup? And nothing ever happens in the World Cup because we've got our priorities uh, short term. For, for an organisation that had loads of money in the bank before all this happened, the IRFU tended to think very short term about getting the team to be successful as opposed to thinking, well, maybe if we actually were to do well in the World Cup, it might be better in the long run. Will on Mick says, Jesus, who would have thought Big Mick was a good manager? Oh, that's right, everybody, apart from Gilroy, if you look at Mick's past teams, he actually plays good football when he has the players. Really? I mean, did we just not watch the Ireland team for the last period of time? Have you not heard him do COCOM? Like, and look, congratulations, he's doing great at Cardiff, he deserves us, fair play, but uh, the notion that he always plays good football when he has the players. Got relegated to Sunderland with a record low total of points. OTBM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We'll take a quick break. Stephen Ferris, standing by. We'll talk to him next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB. Well, don't, don't shoot. Don't, don't shoot. shoot. Oh, he dinged it. Oh! Oh, no, 50 seconds left. That is amazing. 
Live. OTB Live commentary. Never miss the action right here on OTB Sports Radio. Keep up to date with the latest scores on the OTB Sports app. The OTB Sports app. Live score updates straight to your phone. Calling all builders, joiners, plasterers and dry liners. Need advice on the right materials for the job? Consider it done. You need them on site and in your hand. Consider it done. You want access to over 10,000 products from the leading construction brands without having to start up the van. Consider it done. There's another way of doing things. ETAG. We talk with you to solve your problem and deliver what you need directly onto site. No second guessing, no seconds wasted. Click etag.ie. Check out the Boyle Sports app today for details on which football match is getting the no-lose treatment this week. Plus, study the form with our Racing Post Spotlight before watching the action with free live streaming on all UK and Irish horse races. See the Boyle Sports app for full T's and C's. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie 18 plus. OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It is 11 minutes past 8. If you want to get in touch this morning, 087-9180-180 is the WhatsApp number. You can always uh, leave a comment on the YouTube channels. Uh, what's the hashtag? Is it be kind? Don't be kind. It's fine. We have uh, broad shoulders. We can take it. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Going to go to rugby. We'll talk to Stephen Ferris in just one second. The Ireland team has been uh, possible teams have been published in both the Indo and the Times. And there's a slight difference. Hugo Keenan starts at fullback, and then the back line is essentially what you'd expect. Gibson Park, Sexton, James Lowe and Jordan Larmer on the wings, or maybe Keith Earls with Henshaw and Ring Rose. And then the pack, the front row is the same, both of them. Kilcoyne, Kelleher and Furlong uh, start in the front row. A, a second row of Henderson and James Ryan. Tyke Byrne starts at six in both teams, um, Keen Tracy's and... Uh, Jerry Thornley's, and then at seven, it's Will Connors for Thornley and CJ Stander at eight. It's Josh Ander Fleer and CJ Stander in the back row for Keen Tracy. Stephen Ferris, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good morning, not too bad, Jerry. How's things? Yeah, we're excited to uh, see how this team performs this weekend. What's the pressure like in the camp when you're getting it in the neck on all sides and it seems like the whole world is out to get you? What's that actually like for the players this week? <laughs> Um, yeah, it can be tough, and I know the the players and the coaching group, um, they do their press conferences and say that they don't listen to any of the outside media. Um, and yeah, it, it can be tough. I think every individual uh, is different, um, and it's just about how those players cope with the pressure. They're just going to keep on training. They're going to keep on doing their thing, and hopefully, when they pitch up at the weekend, they can turn it on. But as we all know, Jar. Um, Looking from the outside in, it doesn't all seem to be clicking. The cogs don't all seem to be turning in the same direction. Um, and I think after this match at the weekend, we're gonna we're gonna know a lot more about this Ireland team and how far they've actually come over the last number of months. And back to your point, if they can deal with the pressure that they're currently under. The the fact that the team isn't clicking at the moment, is it close to clicking? Or, or do they look like they're they're doing the right thing again and again and it's just not happening for a reason or is the underlying process bad? Yeah, well, you know, I was just reading through some stuff this morning actually from when Mike Cat came into the system, um, into the coaching ticket of Ireland and what he was looking for. Um, he talks about nailing your opportunities and you know, they, they certainly feel, Andy Farrell and, and Mike Cat, that they're creating opportunities. Um, but we all know that you don't execute absolutely everything all the time. And that's the big concern at the minute is that um, Ireland aren't producing enough uh, entries into the opposition 22. They're not creating enough opportunities. Um, and, yeah, you know, going forward into the bigger matches, those opportunities are going to become less and less and less. So uh, you can't expect any team to go out and kneel, as Mike Hatt says, um, the opportunities that present themselves. It's not going to happen. You're going to nail every single one of those. But it's taken maybe one out of three or one out of four. But currently Ireland are maybe creating three or four a game. And the stats show that because you know, Ireland have only scored two tries in two games. They're the lowest off offloading team. And people talk about the offload. It's not, Jared, just as simple as running into somebody. I've been chatting about this during the week. Running into somebody and just 
throwing the ball over your head like Nakarawa and, and hope the offload goes to hand. You got to actually get beyond the contact. You got to suck in defenders. You got to try and shorten that line somehow. And watching Ireland over the last, not just over the last couple of couple of weeks, but over the last probably since the World Cup, it's very one-dimensional, head down, recycle ball. Um, and I don't think it's a fear of offloading. I don't think it's a fear of making a mistake. I just think there's there's no execution of footwork pre-contact to get that half yard, to have trail runners. Like you would have seen Tommy Bow absolutely hairing off his wing at five, six, seven times a game just in case there's an offload on the off chance. So I think there's a number of things that, uh, in my personal opinion, that are cert- certainly adding to the pressure mounting up it- and, and why Ireland aren't scoring tries. The trail runners is really interesting because you, you have to be quite brave to run that line because most often it doesn't actually come off and it means that there's a there's a potential if you get turned over for there to be a defensive hole where you've left essentially your teammates are going to have to uh, make up for it and so I don't know is is that is that a little bit the fear is that you're creating opportunity for the opposition if they turn you over and you're going to get the blame for it. Like, where does the, the absence of trail runners come from? It's, it's not that they can't do it. It's not that they're not fast enough. It's like, you know, we have the players who have who do it for their club. So why aren't they doing it at the international level? Yeah, I don't think you should be worrying about that, to be honest, Jer. Like, you know, if there's one man there to clear the rock, he should be able to get the job done. You know, that's the way they, they should be looking at it. Um, you talk about the trail runners. It all makes it a good bit easier if you actually do use a bit of foot, footwork or you do get wider and you don't continuously run into brick walls and just put the head down. Um, another thing is uh, actually identifying weaknesses in the opposition. And that's one thing that I haven't been impressed with with Ireland. Something under Joe Smith, you would have recognised his starter plays, um, certain small intricacies around uh, phase play where they isolated somebody who was a weak defender or... They, they pinpointed something in the backfield that they went after time after time after time. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that at all. And against the French, where they have lazy defenders, they have individuals who don't tackle very well, um, and there was, no, there was no game plan to come up to try and isolate those guys either. So, you know, you're talking about trail runners there. You, you have these trail runners in uh, circumstances where you isolate a weaker defender or you isolate two or three of the, the front row men that are maybe in the midfield after four or five phases beforehand. And then that's where you get your field runners because they're going to be stressed a little bit. So it's, it's just more of more thinking. Uh, are, is the analysis being done? I believe it is being done. I just don't think they're executing everything right. Um, and Mike Cat says in press conference uh, this week that he feels that they're going in the right direction and they're working on things and he's happy with uh, what's being produced. Um, and maybe it is just taking a, a little bit more time for everybody to settle in. Um, but as we both know, Jerry, you don't get much more time in international rugby if results don't, be go, don't go your way. Is there a personnel fix there, Stephen, that would allow the issues that you're talking about to be fixed? Yeah, well, I think Keelan Doris, certainly in the back row, um, you know, helps a good bit um, in terms of ball carrying ability. Uh, Josh van der Fleer, you know, he, he carries the ball hard and straight, and he usually pairs onto the ball at pace. But again, there's not there's not really much deception. Reese Ruddock, um, who I, I think deserves a chance, you know, at international rugby, considering the amount of quality that he's shown in a Leinster jersey. But I think you've just got to have a bit more than that. I think you got to you got to have um, that small bit of footwork, that explosive power, um, and you know, Keelan Doris has shown. Uh, he is. He, people talk about oh, yeah, he's a bit more of a ball player. What, what does that mean? Like, you know, what does a ball player mean? Well, it's probably Keelan Doris and CJ Stander. You know, CJ Stander just gets the ball, trucks it, gets the ball, trucks it, gets the ball, trucks it. Here, he's very good at it. He's very, very good at it. But when he takes a step up in the opposition, defenses get better and better. He negate that um, so easily. So, yeah, I think personnel, um, James Ryan has been a bit of a miss as well. He's very good at actually finding space in between defenders instead of running directly at uh, at the opposition. So maybe two or three lads in the pack there that can mix it up. And it's all about winning game lines. And, and unfortunately, Ireland just we haven't seen those half breaks to get in behind teams. We haven't seen enough entries into the 22. We haven't seen enough of isolating uh, weaknesses in the opposition and taking advantage of that. 
Um, and you know, we, we, we need to keep building on that and, and, and hopefully they can find ways to break down the opposition. Um, but like, we can only go by what we've, what we've watched recently. And you know, you, you take a game by game um, and the last couple of games haven't been impressive. That's the reality of it, it hasn't been. So all this pressure and hype and media storm that's coming around Andy Farrell and the personal responsibility and the players, the head coach, or excuse me, the captain, Johnny Sexton, it's it's all justified to a certain degree because they haven't been producing. And um, yeah, player personnel, I think, w would certainly help in, in a few areas. It's funny how uh, when Ty Furlong was back, Brian O'Driscoll was like, look how much we missed him. When he gets the ball, he takes it into contact and he passes it to somebody else. And all of a sudden, a move doesn't break down, there isn't a rook, the, the play continues, and we make 20 or 30 metres almost, almost effortlessly. And it seems like it's such a small thing to point out that, you know, obviously Furlong is there primarily for his ability in the scrum, but actually it's the hands, that it's these little things that, that make a difference. So maybe we get the performance this week and all of a sudden Furlong is back in and never leaves again and that year out that he's missed <laughs> with injuries. Do you know, and... I have a little bit of sympathy for Andy Farrell. I know in international rugby you're always going to have about one third of your team injured because it's so it's so vicious at the moment and it's so physically violent. Uh, it's just that he's been suffering with key players who James Ryan last week, for example, is he is he a three point difference in that game? Maybe he is. I don't know. Like I don't know enough about what the individual uh, impact would be. If if Hugo Keenan straightens up and and takes that defender two more yards that's enough room for James Lowe to get over the line and, and knock it out, and suddenly the game is flipped. If Peter O'Mahony doesn't have a moment of madness against Wales, I think we'd beat that Wales team, because frankly, I don't think that Wales team were very good. But, uh, like, Andy Farrell sitting two losses in, he can't really talk like that, because that sounds like making excuses. Yeah, definitely. And, and I totally agree with you, Jer, regarding the, the, the Wales game. Um, and it is such fine margins at this level. But the worrying thing in the Wales game was that you know they, they sort of had a bit of a brain fart for you know half an hour in, in that second half where they couldn't get it, get the grips of the game and you know it wasn't just the Peter Amani red card that lost Ireland in the game you know it was the kicking the ball out on the full a couple of times missing touch with the penalty you know Billy Burns missed a, a penalty punch as well you know, there's five or six things in the second half that start the alarm bells start to go off. And then when you make those mistakes week in, week out, then, you know, Billy, uh, and, and you know, I know it was all over social media opportunities that, you know, just kicking the ball away and, um, you know, missing touch and, you know, playing in the right areas to pitch at the right times. And, and these things are happen, happening regularly. Um, and that's where the concern is coming from. And, and also why our attack isn't functioning as everybody was hoping it was going to be because, you know, if Joe Smith was still in charge, you could understand why we were only offloading six times because he was very vocal and that, you know, he, he wanted dominance of just retaining the ball and not taking too many risks, being very pragmatic. But that's not the case. You know, the, the Irish coaching staff have come out and said that they want to play a different style of rugby. Uh, and I, I disagree with you in terms of, you know, the French game only been a couple of points and if you go Keenan straightens. I think if James Lowe scores that try and, and you know James Ryan's playing and he adds an extra three points, if France still win that game, yeah. um, it yeah. just felt like they, they had another gear or another couple of gears. Um, and yeah, it wasn't until the last you know 15 minutes or so that we started to show a, a bit more enterprise when Mr. Drico was talking about the, the softer hands and um, playing a wide, wide pattern when it's gone. Um, and they do have the capabilities to do that. And even watching the Pro 14 at the weekend and watching Munster in the second half, um, the sub hooker, I was trying to remember his name there, who, who come on and very, very good with ball in hand, just changing the point um, of, of play, whether that's a ball inside, a ball outside, um, and creating just deception for the, the opposition was fantastic. And it's amazing how many wee small five, four or five yard busts that Munster made in, the, in, in that game and on Saturday night. And that certainly went a long way to, to, for them getting field position and getting on top of the opposition. So, yeah, I completely agree with Brian. You know, it, it, it's all about having options. Um, and over the last couple of weeks, Ireland have looked like they have very limited options. 
What is the story with Billy Burns? What do you think? Is, is he good enough from what you've seen week in, week out with Ulster to make it at an international level? Have, have we yet seen what his true level is in an Ireland shirt? Yeah, like it's um, it's tough. Like it, it, it's tough on him. It hasn't been ideal, has it? Um, I'm under huge criticism after the Welsh game, and uh, you know, Jacob Stockdale dropped the ball over the line um, against against Leinster in a European Cup quarter final, and I give him a hard time for that. I think Draco was on with me as well, and we we both give him a hard time for that. And you know, something similar. Know, there might not have been a try that came from that kick into the corner, but you know, it was a huge mistake at a crucial time in the match, uh, and he didn't deliver. I think Billy has got all the skills. He definitely has all the skills. He's got. He's got. Um, he's quite a vocal player by all accounts. Um, he usually manages games very, very well. The only concern that I would say, Jer, is that when it comes to the big games, even in in Europe for Ulster, where that's to lose. Um, home and away in the European Cup over the last couple of years. Um, whether that's against Leinster a couple of weeks ago when Johnny Sexton had a, an absolute howler in the first half, you know that that's when you want to see Billy Burns stamp his authority on the match and go right. Sexton's down here. I'm going to get on top of him. You know, this is a point for me to prove to the Irish coach and staff that I, I can step up my game when when Johnny sort of you know. Um, Faltering a little bit, and then Johnny came out in the second half and went boom, winging up my game. And Billy didn't at all. He, if anything, his went the other way a little bit, and that would be concerning for me that when he comes under pressure in the bigger games, whether that's against Le- Leinster or Toulouse and European Cups or, or or with Ireland and the opportunities that he's got, he hasn't delivered, and he's made a few mistakes. Um, and you know he made a few mistakes in that in that Welsh game. There are a few negative impacts that, uh, that had an effect on where Ireland were, especially in the last 15 minutes. So um, everything is, is that, that I've watched over the last couple of years um, would suggest to me, Jer, that he's a, an extremely good player when he's not under serious pressure, but when the pressure comes on, he seems to make more mistakes. Um, so that may, maybe answers your question that at international level, you're going to come under serious, serious heat, but maybe he needs more time and exposure at that level to see if he can cut those little errors out uh, and maybe kick on. Um, but at the minute, it, it, I don't think anybody is is uh, is up to the level where Johnny Sexton was maybe a year or two ago. And, you know, is Harry Byrne the answer? Ross Byrne, uh, Billy Burns, you know, Jack Cardy, you know, young Fitzgerald at Connacht as well. He seems to be forgotten about. So it, it just, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Definitely. Definitely. Well, it, like, can you actually? Well, like, what's the best way to play that then, Stephen? If, if you realise that that's going to be one of the big issues for a player, not not necessarily just an out half, but any player in the Irish setup, is it just to throw them into the heat as young as possible and hope they develop into it, or can that actually ruin a player? Yeah. Um, like from a personal point of view, like obviously made an international debut at, at 21 and um, given a, a half. Decent game against the uh, Pacific Islanders and you know, look for Sterling and Jamie Heaslip. And you talk about guys given opportunity when they're young. Like Luke Fitzgerald was just out of school at Black Rock, um, thrown in the, the last international game at Lansdowne Road, packed out house. Huge pressure on him individually, but he came through it o- o- okay. But at the minute, we don't have the luxury of that. We don't have the luxury of you know Pacific Islands or Fiji, Samoa um, coming for um, autumn internationals. You can mix and match a bit and that's why I thought the Autumn Nations Cup would have been the perfect time to, to give more guys opportunity and you know, Andy Farrell has capped a good few guys but there hasn't been a consistent run you know for two or three games where you, where you see the same faces it's always just in and out in and out um, and yeah it, it's extremely difficult to do that especially as you as you know guys when, you're, when your backs are against the wall here as Ireland's are and you're trying to chase a result and God forbid if, if Ireland, you know, lost it this weekend, um, all hell would break loose. So, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. But I believe if you're going to invest in somebody like Billy Burns um, as Johnny Sexton's uh, right-hand man, um, then he's got to have more exposure. He's got to have more game time. If it's not Billy, it's Harry Byrne or Ross. 
um, then you got to make sure that they're starting two two out of the five games in the Six Nations to give them that chance and exposure at that level. Uh, quickly, just to finish up, uh, Stephen, just for this weekend's team, uh, Irish Independent, Irish Times have a couple of different teams this morning. Just looking at the Irish Times as, as it's in front of me, and I think the Irish Independent have this as well. Ty Byrne being moved to six is an interesting development. Uh, I, I guess not too many people would have seen it, just because of the depth that Ireland have in that back row. Are you excited to see this? Is there a future for Ty Byrne at six? Yeah, potentially, yes. Um, he's played a, a number of times for the Scarlets uh, over the years, like um, in the sixth jersey. He's very, very good in, o- over the ball, as, as, as we've seen in, in recent months. Um, brilliant do- line-out operator. Um, but again, is he, a, is he a super ball carrier that's going to get you over over the gain line? He, he's just going to... Dis- like, this is the thing, and um, with Ireland's back five in the in the scrum four five six seven eight they're lads that don't really make mistakes but they're not really um they don't give us that go forward and, and given us those small two three yard burst and explosive carries that are getting us across the game line and and making the opposition miss half tackles and like that's where i would like to see uh you know obviously Keelan doris come in there and then you can maybe talk about Coons. Um, again, he was very good for Munster at the weekend, but certainly I, th- I think Tag is, is a is a huge option there. I, I like Will Connors more at seven. Uh, to be honest, I think his offloading ability is very good at, at Lincoln. And uh, and um, as we were chatting earlier with Jerry there about those trio lines, he always seems to be hovering about. He's not just a, a chop tackler. So uh, yeah, the back row is always an interesting one and. You no know, CJ Stander uh, at number eight. I would like to see him put under a bit more pressure as well, because I think when, when he's under pressure, he seems to perform a lot better. So, yeah, we, we could have our opinions and argue the house down of what back row is uh, is best, but we all know it's not your job or my job to select that, and hopefully Andy Farrell gets it right this weekend. We're going to win this game by about 20 points at the weekend, aren't we? That's that's the, uh, like... <laughs> Jerry, I, I love your optimism um, for sure. I think the spread is, is 20, 22 points or something like that um, on the game, so you're probably bang on there. Uh, if Ireland don't win this game, Jerry, by more than 15 points, I think the pressure is, is huge once again. Like it, it, It's just going to come right on top of the lads. Um, we should win the game by 20 points or more, um, but the way Italy are playing, I think Italy... We're very unfortunate at times uh, against England. A couple of decisions definitely went against them, um, and they finished the game strong uh, Pat, against you England. Have to start? So yeah, for me, I think that I think, I think we'll win by 22 points. <laughs> right. Well, that, that's what the spread says. <laughs> They're never wrong. Good stuff. Thanks a million, Stephen. Cheers. Good to speak to you, lads. Right, uh, the Six Nations show returns today live from 12 o'clock on all our social channels. Neil Tracy is going to be joined by Ian McKinley and Mike McCarthy to preview Ireland Italy. We're going to chat with Amy Mack at a better sensational 2020. Right now, though, let's hear from Ian Henderson. Um, hi, Gorgie. Uh, all, all good, yeah. All good. Uh, can I just hop away from the match for a second? Just news this morning about um, sorting out your new contract. How relieved is the word I'm going to use, but I don't mean it that way, but, you know, in, in terms of getting that all sorted out and you know what's ahead for you for the next two years yeah look it's been um uh it was a bit of a draw not draw out for the a term i was going to use but not probably that fitting it, it's been it's been a long process and delighted to get to the end of it um looking forward to, to having that um put to bed now um don't have to worry about that it's, it's maybe about a week or so ago kind of was was able to 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 check that le- check that box off my list. So delighted to to be able to to finally announce that that, that we've um we're back on for another two years. So so looking forward to it and everything that that could entail, be it down here or be it back up at home. Can I ask you about the influence that Paul O'Connell and John Fulpey have had since they've come in? Um, the lineup seems to be, you know, an area that's that's earned our massively competitive in the scrum is an area that Ireland are equally probably as competitive also. Yeah, look, I, I think. I mentioned this the last time someone was chatting about Polly. Um, Polly hasn't came in and tried to reinvent anything. He hasn't tried to to 
take everything away of what we had learnt before. He, what he has done is, is let us continue to work with what we were doing and adding small tweaks to make us better and better, session by session. Adding adding bits of detail that we might be missing, ensuring that we are getting as as consistent a line out as possible for um for be it the hookers, the jumpers, and the lifters uh, to make sure that ultimately we can have a smoother week running into the running into uh, the game as possible. And the same with Fogs. Fogs has been incredible with with sort of the insight that he that he's brought into the scrum and. Again, he's making the the scrum feel not only about front row, but it's about the eight players that are in the scrum. Because very often, what can happen in scrum meetings is it happens in front rows just sit and talk more or less in a different language than everyone else. And 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 as a second rows, we just stick our heads in and push. Whereas Fogs has brought a whole new dimension to it, if you like, and 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 was really encapsulating the the eight as as one, I suppose, as he likes to put it, to to ensure that. We are getting those performances throughout the week, building for the weekend, the same as the line-out. Thanks, have a good week. Cheers. Okay, now, Nate here in Virgin Media. Um, you seem to slip in very seamlessly into that role of Ireland captain. Is it something that we've got a, a taste for that you'd, you'd uh, like to do again? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to do it again. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, obviously, the result wasn't wasn't what we had wanted, um, but I... I Really enjoyed the the build up to it and and, and during the game, um. Obviously, there there's a, a pecking order of leaders, if you like, ahead of me, and and that's part of the reason why I, when you mentioned the word seamlessly there, that this team has leaders the whole way through it, um, and that's probably one thing that made it feel more seamless for me, or made it more um easy for me to step into that role. The team that I was put in charge of, had leaders from right the way through it, experience um, and inexperience, who were equally capable within with leading each other. Um, and I think that's probably part of the reason um, why there we I was able to step in down that pecking order, if you like. I suppose a few of the positives after that defeat to France was um, some people were commenting on the work rate, uh, you know, the dedication, all the rest of this Irish team. But should those characteristics automatically be part of any Irish team? Yeah, you can say that. You can say that about a lot of things. Like the work rate should be automatically characteristic. The leadership should automatically be characteristic. But in a lot of teams that I've played in, be it Irish or or be it um, Ulster or or wherever else. You don't automatically have those qualities. Those qualities have to be worked on and practiced, like everything else. The the qualities that are that are a given aren't um, aren't always there and need to be continually coached. And probably to, to touch on what Corky asked there, um, the um, the detail, the Paulie's adding the line out. It's it's nothing mind blowingly new. It's 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 the ability to be able to to continue and re coach the small things that everyone. I suppose in inverted commas already knows and to ensure that we're staying on top of that. Andy, in terms of the captaincy, who did you look to maybe uh, or speak to for advice in the build up and even to reflect with afterwards? Yeah, obviously I had a good chat with my family and they were all delighted, frustrated they couldn't be there. Um, I I chatted with John, Johnny pre, uh, prior to a couple of meetings and I had a chat with Polly as well uh, around it and I had a good chat with Rory Best as well um, obviously naming their three captains who I've, cap- who I've been captained by and I think they're three people who who always have set an incredibly good example in any team they've ever captained so like I said with moving into the Ulster captaincy I didn't want to just fall into the exact shoes of one of them I wanted to try and get a get a feel and, and, and do it slightly differently in my own way um which i felt i tried to do um but it, but it was an enjoyable experience nonetheless ian um if i could ask you just because of COVID, how stressful was the contract negotiations we know they spilled it into the six nations obviously but um it's what should be i presume quite straightforward for you ulster captain prime of your career but did it become stressful or did it become very difficult due to the backdrop yeah I- I would say the the initial period was probably more stressful in in terms speaking as a general player in, in the wider in the wider group being able to the contract negotiations have been slightly later than we we maybe would have would have initially anticipated or the way where the where they would be in a usual year and um, that was probably something that that um 
anyone in any profession would find stressful pushing out the, the sec their security going forward. Um, when they got underway, um, the, the discussions that we had, um, with my agent had with, with Nusifora, David Nusifora and, and, and other members um, of his team, they weren't, they weren't painful at all. They, they were uh, understanding and, and I think on, from both sides of the, the table, uh, we knew we knew where we had to get to, and um, uh, didn't take anywhere near as long as probably I thought, I thought it would. Fair enough. And um, do, you, do you have to be conscious of how normally this is, as you said yourself, normally it's put to bed. And normally you're in the middle of the Six Nations, and that's the overwhelming focus. Do you have to be conscious of a couple of guys who are still not as clear cut as you, not out the gate in that regard? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think just in terms of looking out for each other and making sure that everyone's fine. If everyone, anyone has any external stresses, be it contract or be it family or college or anything else. I think you always have to be mindful of your teammates to make sure that, that you have that extra eye outside of the rugby circle because ultimately that will impact the rugby performance, be it training or matches or sleep before a game or, or anything anything like that. So I think being able to, to spot guys when they're maybe struggling a wee bit or maybe they're not themselves, that's uh, that's key. and. And Andy Farrell's great for it. He's he's good for picking up when guys aren't 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 feeling great and checking in on guys. And it's something I think probably this whole uh, this whole whole group are pretty good for as well. Thanks. You, you've obviously been down the sort of the contract routes before, like several times in your career. Just curious, like behind the scenes, has has the landscape changed in terms of offers from elsewhere in terms of COVID and stuff? Like, has it been kind of different in that regard? No, well, you're trying to find out if I had any other offers or. I'm sure you did, but I'm just wondering, like, is it is it less so now? Like, are, are clubs kind of not, you know, trying to catch or maybe as freely as they might have once was? Uh, it's, it's it's a difficult one to put it. Obviously, the, most of the Irish contracts have been done a lot later than everywhere else. Um, I've only ever had eyes for Ireland, so that's uh, <laughs> so that's that's kind of it's it's a it's a difficult one the way to put it. Um. F few players um, would would try and play clubs off against each other. You would you wouldn't necessarily get that far down the line for clubs to be making huge cash offers um, or or any cash offers before showing some sort of real commitment. Um, I think that most of the players, um, the type of people they are, they don't they're not really most of our team and and most of the provinces anyway. They don't, wouldn't really play a lot of people off each other, um, so I think I think there's been a lot of factors which have which have made negotiations this year a lot a lot different, but but uh, maybe not in the way that you, that you're saying. Cheers, appreciate that. Ian, if I could okay, guys, finish up here, Neil. Neil, finish up with you. Thanks. Yeah, I just just have a, a small one just to double check something on the contract. So it's up to twenty twenty three. Would that be the end of the, the World Cup cycle as such? Um, no, it's 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 two years from the start of this season coming. Um, maybe there might be an extra month in there to get in line with the global season. Um, so pr it'll it, the contract will run, I believe, uh, until July thirty first, twenty twenty three. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Okay, so AIG Insurance has partnered up with TG Cahar and the LGFA to help showcase the teams of the 2020 All Ireland Ladies Football Championships and the AIG Goal of the Year competition. The award show is on TG Cahar this Sunday at a quarter past seven. Armaz Amy Macken is nominated for both Player of the Year and Goal of the Year, and I'm delighted to say she is with us now. Amy, how are you getting on? I'm not too bad. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let's get straight to that goal, because for people who aren't sure, first of all, which goal it is, it's the one with the dummy hop, the Dublin player left on the ground, and then the ball is smashed at the roof of the net with the outside of your left foot, I think it's fair to say. Uh, did you realise what a cracker it was as soon as you hit it? Um, no, not really, until afterwards and I seen Twitter. Um, but uh, obviously I wish the game ended with us winning, but it didn't. Um, but yeah, I suppose the goal was a nice nice finish for me. Um, it's something that I work on in training, so it was just sort of instinctive when it happened. I 
I knew I had to take the chance. Did Twitter go totally crazy afterwards? <laughs> I had a good few notifications. Because <laughs> uh, I remember we showed the clip on our show on the Monday morning after it happened and we tweeted it out and then one of our American contributors who talks basketball with us, Ryan Jones, tweeted it off his account. And then all of a sudden you had a load of Americans uh, replying to it saying, this is amazing, what is this sport? And I think you've done a service for the sport as much as anything else. Well, at least that's something. People really commented on the combination of skills that were involved, like for people who weren't familiar with the sport. They were like, oh, they managed to bring so many different skills to the fore here. And that was the beauty of it. It was like when that James Cargill went viral for Mayo the, the previous year. Just all yeah. these different things at play. He ran down the wing, uh, destroyed a load of men who were trying to, to get the ball off him, and then it was a beautiful finish. It was kind of the same with you. It was the fact that you managed to get around an opponent and also the finish was sublime as well. You kind of needed everything in your locker. Yeah, and um, I suppose as a forward, when we get them opportunities, we have to take them. Um, and it was a period in the game where we needed a goal, probably. Um, and we probably should have pushed on, but unfortunately we didn't. But yeah, it was nice. It was a nice uh, nice goal to get. And um, hopefully many more to come. Do you always back yourself in situations like that, even if it's two or three players between you and the goal? Uh, yeah, I think you have to as a forward. Um, obviously, you have to read the situation and know whether you're going to get into that space or not. Um, but you work on that sort of thing in training and uh, I come up against strong defenders in training. So uh, it's always tough and we're sort of um, used to that kind of environment. So it's just all about practice and when an opportunity comes, you have to take it. It does seem that there is more of a, an appreciation maybe from coaches at the moment that the take your points and the goals will come mantra isn't necessarily true all the time. Um, not necessarily. I suppose there's probably different periods in the game when I probably would have just maybe slotted that over the bar. Um, but it was just at a period of a game where, as I say, I knew we needed something, um, maybe a little spark or something. So I just sort of had a go for it. And as I say, it was just all instinct, really. Was 2020 your best goal scoring season? Just focusing on goals alone now? Um, I think it probably was. It's not something I think too much about. So I don't count them up every year, I think. Um, maybe that's for other people to talk about, but <laughs> it probably was. I'm not too sure. Because the other game that stands out outside of the Armagh jersey obviously was after your comeback for the club and scoring eight goals against Cross McGlenn in a half of football, I think that was? Yeah, I think I played 30 minutes, so that's all I was allowed. Um, that was, I think, my second game back after my injury, so um, it was just, uh, that's all I was given was 30 minutes. But again, it was, a lot of work was done for <laughs> me. Um, I just had to put the ball in the back of the net, so... Yeah, uh, as long as we got the win, I wasn't too worried about what I scored. It does sound a, a tad modest, and, and you do wonder what might have happened had he been left on for longer than half an hour. <laughs> um, I mightn't have scored that much if it was on for the hour, so <laughs> um, who knows? Uh, I think that they're still trying to figure out whether or not the, it's the fastest hat-trick in our Mac Club football. I think it was a minute and 45 seconds, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, so... Hopefully that gets cleared you up. You know more than me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you go one better uh, this season. Uh, just on the Dublin game that we've been speaking about, you said obviously it is in the context of disappointment ultimately, I guess. It's no Ireland semi-final. How did you take that defeat to Dublin? Because they are clearly the standard bearers in the sport at the moment. And yet there is a sense that you provided something that day that caused them a lot of trouble. Yeah, uh, obviously Dublin have set the standards so high over the last few years and they're continuing to set the standards higher. Um, so it was up to us maybe to try and get as close as we can to them. And I think the game itself, we just went in with no fear and we just knew we had to um, bring our game and try our best. Um, they probably were that wee bit better than us on the day and a wee bit more experienced, but it's something that we'll take, take into next year and hopefully that can help drive us on and improve. But it's exciting, I suppose, for us in Armagh um, because we know there's not a lot of talent. But I think it's up to us now what we sort of do with it and how we push on. That experience, I presume, is a key component. This was your first semi-final since 2015. What did you learn from the experience? Um, I'd say just the composure of Dublin in the second half, uh, how they steadied the game and how they maybe controlled it that way be better than us um, is something that we can look at and try to put into our own game but as you say you can only learn from games like that and 
when you're up against the best, obviously it was disappointing at the time because we did want we wanted to reach an all Ireland final. Um but yeah, you just have to learn from it and after it uh, we were lucky enough to have an Ulster final then to look forward to and move on. So it was good to finish on a high. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I guess as well, when you reflect on 2020, a lot of people will, even sports people who had good years, would probably think of it as a little bit of a disappointment. I guess from your perspective, it could have, it went as good as it possibly could have gone just on, on a personal level because of that injury, giving yourself that extra few months to actually get back. Because you probably thought going into 2020, you might not kick a ball for our map. But as it turned out, you were there for the full season. Yeah, it was sort of funny because um, prior to the lockdown and restrictions, um, I was going to the league games and just watching, obviously, from the sideline. Um, and then when everything happened, it was sort of like I might have a shout here at playing a championship because at that point of the year, I, I didn't know what way I was going to return and when I was going to return. But um, I suppose the lockdown probably did benefit me. It gave me a wee bit more time and it gave me then a target to where I wanted to get there and when I wanted to to get there because it was your cruciate in 2019 you did yeah yeah that game that was in the game against cork right in yeah that was in yeah against cork we beat cork that day actually and um, so it was a mixed emotions kind of day obviously i was delighted for the win but then to get the injury it wasn't too nice how long does it take to get back to a place where you feel that you're able to kick a ball again, that you're able to run again? Because I'd imagine that just the, the mental battle that is, as well as the physical battle of doing your cruciate, uh, in such a big game against Cork as well the previous summer, must have been a, a massive battle for you. Yeah, and I sort of had a wee bit of time before I got my surgery, but straight after the surgery, I probably wasn't thinking too much about my return. Um, I didn't really focus on it at all, actually. I was probably just focused on how I was going to walk properly and getting my movement back in my leg. And it was sort of, I just took each step as I came. I didn't look too far ahead until when I got onto the pitch then. I just sort of, that's when I started to look ahead to my return. And before that, yeah, I was just getting your head wrapped around how you were going to do it and taking advice from everyone and just learning. I had to really educate myself as much as I could and um, just to set set up a process of how I was going to um, overcome the injury. What helped you on that? What what informed that process? Um, well, my family definitely helped me. Um, they were here most most of the time when I was doing what I needed to do. Um, everyone around me just sort of helped me and you need people around you. Um, obviously yourself, I, uh, I told myself what I needed to do and I just sort of got on with it really I didn't think too much about it obviously the first when I got the news it wasn't uh, a nice couple of days but from then on and I just sort of took it as I came and knew I just had to put in the work to get where I wanted to be. It's really interesting because a lot of people suffer from a cruciate and then maybe don't come back to the player that they were and that's why I was asking about is this your best goal scoring season that we saw last year you seem to be one of the few people who's come back and put in her best season after such a terrible injury. Yeah, and it's strange as well because you do you hear them stories of people not returning and you sort of maybe there's a few times you have them thoughts of what way you're going to return. Are you going to be the same player? Are you going to be worse? So I think I sort of didn't let myself get carried away with that sort of thing. I just knew what way I was going to control it and if I control what I'd done with the work and put it in, I knew I'd get there. But uh, yeah, I probably surprised myself then when I came back uh, the season that I had. Do you, as a team, have a singular ambition now for 2021, given the progress that you've had over the past couple of years? Well, I think every year, I'm not sure if the National League's going to head, but every year you go into the league, you want to win it. It's the same with every championship you're in. When you're in the Ulster Championship, you want to win it. And when you go into the All-Ireland, you want to win it. So every year we just take it as it comes, each game as it comes. Um, but we've set our standards high now last year and we just need to keep, make sure we keep pushing at them and keep improving. How do you keep taking over given the current restrictions? Like, I'm not sure if you're living with your sister and, and your brothers. Is, so that, I guess that's a bit of an advantage then that you've got a few other footballers in the house. Yeah, so there's four of us. Um, and obviously it's nice to have Black in here as well because uh, it's easier, a wee bit easier to motivate each other and um, to get up and do the training. But yeah, we program sent out and we just keep ticking them off and hopefully it'll be sooner now that we're back on the pitch and make it a wee bit easier for us. 
what what does the program involve at the moment? Is it mostly fitness work or, or how does it look? Um, a couple of gym sessions a week. We're lucky enough to have a bit of a gym set up uh, at the side of our house in the way shed. So gym sessions and two running programs at the minute. So um, it's sort of hard when you don't know what you're aiming towards or when you're aiming towards it, but we just keep having to do what we have to do just to get in the best shape uh, going into the same head whenever it comes around. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, just a reminder that AIG Insurance has partnered up with TG Cahar and the LGFA to help showcase the teams of the 2020 All-Ireland Ladies Football Championships and the AIG Goal of the Competition. The award show is on TG Cahar this Saturday at 7.15. You've been listening to Amy Mackin and she is nominated for both Player of the Year and Goal of the Year. Amy, thanks a million. No problem at all. Thank you. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. Shaw going to pull this one back to the byline. And it's hooked into the goal by Bruno Fernandes. What a finish from the Portuguese midfielder for Manchester United. Manchester United make the trip to Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea this Sunday in the Premier League. And we'll have full live match commentary for you on Off the Ball. Damien Delaney will be with Stephen Doyle calling that game for us. And before that, Brian Kerr and Nathan Murphy are on duty for Tottenham versus Burnley. There'll be the pay per view too with Cleana O'Connor and Johnny Ward. All that and plenty more on this Sunday's Off the Ball, live from 1 until 7. Off the Ball, don't miss a moment of the action every weekend from 1 pm on OTB Sports Radio. Listen live on the OTB Sports app. Check out the Boyle Sports app today for details on which football match is getting the no-lose treatment this week. Plus, browse through dozens of new player markets, all powered by Opta. Shots on target, left foot, right foot, headed goals, assists and more. See the Boyle Sports app for full T's and C's. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie 18 plus. Tom Watson, you're welcome to Golf Weekly. Hey, this is going to be fun. Very happy to say European captain and, of course, three-time major winner, Padraig Carrington, joins us. Today's special guest on Golf Weekly is... Is Lee Westwood. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm honoured and delighted. Let's bring in Paul McGinley, who joins us now. Paul, you're very welcome. Shane Lowry, how are you keeping? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Well, I'm as good <laughs> as I can be. The biggest names in golf and Ireland's best golf podcast, Golf Weekly, now exclusively available on Patreon. Go to otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly to sign up now. OTB. AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It's 8.57 this morning. You're very welcome along to uh, OTBA. And obviously, I'm going to tell you about what's going on with Golf Weekly. Uh, you can sign up now for it. Here's... But obviously, guys like you and Peter can fathom it pretty well. I was fortunate enough in my uh, my two wins on the PJ Tour where I had a, a two-stroke lead on the final green at Quicken Loans and rolled in about a 35-footer. And, and when I won Barbasol, I had a you know a little one-foot tap in. You know, I didn't have to think about it too much. But uh, I can remember one time for sure, 2014, trying to keep my job playing the FedEx uh, Open in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I had about a 10-footer for par on the last to finish solo second, which was a big chunk of change for me at the time. And it was really the only time I've ever thought, you know what, this putt's worth three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And I went ahead and, and I slammed it in. But Typically, the pros really aren't thinking so much about the money, but it's like you said, it's that three-footer for the win with a little bit of break. That's the one you're going to think about a little bit. Mm. And yes, Peter, you, th- you talk th- a lot about it. Sorry, go on now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. next time you're in contention, and Peter, I'm sure you you were in similar positions as well. The next time you're in contention, Troy, and you're standing on a putt on 18, they'll say he never felt pressure like this. Yes, <laughs> the pressure when it's your livelihood at stake, I'd imagine is so much more intense. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's nice to have it for the win, but a lot of guys have those on the 18th to make the cut, to keep their job. I mean, the, there's a lot of different, you know, pressure putts you can have on that 18th hole from three feet that uh, that aren't just for the win. Then, uh, yeah, guys feel them all the time. I mean, even on the on the PGA Tour, on the European Tour, guys are going to feel those three-footers, especially when they mean a whole lot at the end of a golf tournament. Yeah, so that was Troy Merritt on the latest episode of Golf Weekly. And by now, I'm sure most of you know that from March the 11th, Golf Weekly is moving to Patreon. If you sign up, you'll get a guaranteed podcast every Thursday and extra episodes around the biggest tournaments of the year, interviews with golf's biggest names as well. Troy Merritt's going to be a regular on it over the next while too. You can uh, become an official friend of the pod. You'll be able to chat to the lads, Joe, Nathan, Peter and Fionn. You'll get invites to our golf days. They will start again. Don't worry. By the end of the year, we're going to be playing golf. Come hell or high water, we're like uh, that restaurateur and those people opening up. We're just going to do it anyway, even if we're not allowed. 
Uh, we're not, don't worry. And you can enjoy exclusive watch parties around the majors. Get on to otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly. You can search golf weekly on patreon.com. The page is live now. It's going gangbusters, Three ninety nine a month. Sure, what else? It's uh, cheaper than the price of a Pro V. And you'll get the lads in your earballs uh, every single week. Um, today's golf week is going to be heavily focused on the Tiger Woods story, obviously. A very special interview available now too, which will become a regular segment across the show this year on Tour Pro and two-time event winner Troy Merritt will be checking in with the lads across the year, updating them on his game and giving exclusive access to life on the PGA Tour. The first episode of Troy is available to download now, but you'll need to subscribe to the Patreon page for more because after March the 11th, it is going behind the paywall. It is bang on 9 o'clock. John Duggan, good morning to you. How are you? Good, uh, Jaron Owen and yourselves. Yeah, there's some um, news coming through from the French Rugby Federation that one of the players has tested positive yesterday and they've suspended training today which makes it very, very difficult to see how the hell this game is going to go ahead for them at the weekend. You'd wonder why it was given uh, the green light in the first place with 11 players uh, early in the week tested positive for COVID. And they could have had it. I know Scotland have had issues with the club and the national team and everything, but they could have put it back to next weekend. And even if it does go ahead, if you've got a second string, completely second string French team, I don't know. I don't know what it says for the competition. I... I I'd say if you're um, Andy Farrell, you're feeling, hang on a second, so I had a man sent off against Wales, and then I played the French just before they got the COVID. This is not working out for me in terms of luck. Well, Andy Farrell just has to do what he has to do. So I don't think luck should come into it for him. He should be winning these matches. Uh, and if he doesn't, he doesn't. So I think we need to just judge Andy Farrell and what he does within his window. Um, and now he's picking his team this lunchtime to play uh, Italy uh, on Saturday in Rome. Um, whether it's a conservative selection or not, he's going to play the big ones. He's going to play Johnny Sexton, who'll be back. The only real calls, I think, for him to make are at right wing and uh, on the uh, open side. So we're maybe looking at Larmer or Earls or Connors or Van der Fleer. Apart from that, I think we can pretty much name the team. It'll be Keenan, it'll be Lowe, it'll be Henshaw and Ring Rose, it'll be Sexton, probably with Gibson Park. It'll be a new front row um, of uh, Dave Kilcoyne. Ronan Keller will get a first start. Uh, Tiger Furlong will be in there. Henderson and Ryan, James Ryan will be back. And probably Tiger Byrne and CJ Stander at six and eight. So that's what we're looking at today, lads. Um, last night in the uh, Champions League, it was 19 wins in a row for Manchester City. Have we all just stopped watching them at this stage? Uh, they beat Borussia Mönchengladbach 2-0. Um, Spurs uh, into the last 16 of the Europa League, an 8-1 win over Wolfsburger. The prodigal son scored Gareth Bale and Deli Alli. Um, and United, Arsenal, Leicester and uh, Rangers all in action later. United already threw effectively a 4-0 advantage from the first leg over Real Sociedad into their match at Old Trafford. Arsenal and Benfica tied the goal apiece going into their tie in Athens. Uh, Leicester and Slavia Prague scoreless ahead of their match at the King Power Stadium. Rangers 4-3 up on Royal Antwerp ahead of their game. Mick McCarthy's card, if you've been talking about it a lot on the show already, into the championship playoff spots, a 2-1 win over Bournemouth last night. Very sad news about the father of the Liverpool goalkeeper, Alison Becker. He sadly drowned in a lake near his holiday home in Brazil yesterday. Uh, Jose Becker had been swimming at a dam uh, near his property, and uh, police say no foul play is suspected. Um, Rory McIlroy and Shane Lowry in the field for the WGC Workday Championship in Florida today. Uh, Seamus Power and Patrick Harrington are in Puerto Rico for the Puerto Rico Open, and a national hunt card today at Turles, lads. Uh, the first off there at 2.20. Sad news about Tom Foley yesterday passing away at the age of 74, the trainer of Donoli, the Carlo trainer, the people's horse in the 1990s when he went to Cheltenham and won when we couldn't buy a winner at Cheltenham. Um, we'll talk a bit more about uh, Donoli in a couple of minutes with Tom alone, but uh, your golf tips just recently, John, you're nearly on fire. You're, there's like a, there's a bit of kindling and there's smoke and there's a, a, a breeze uh, which is building to a hurricane and you just need something to catch fire. You've hit the post two weeks in a row. Um, yeah, at Finau last week, he was second and, and did everything uh, and then lost that playoff to Max Homa, who I tipped the week before. And I tipped Daniel Berger the week before he won. Yeah. So I've had four second places in seven weeks <laughs> and I do feel quite frustrated. But I do also feel that I'm seeing things and I do feel that uh, winners will come and we'll make profit out of this by the end of the year. It is only February. It feels like, it feels like forever but uh, that's the, the case when you're watching five hours of golf. I went to bed on Sunday night pretty brand off, but um, that's the way it goes, and you just have to just take it on the chin 
Uh, but I do feel I'm saying things, and I feel I'm saying things because I'm watching it, a lot of it. So virtual insanity, I'm skipping this tournament in Florida because the, tur the course is new, the concession course is new. You're back in blind. You really have to be back in players on form, whereas in Puerto Rico, we have form to look at. So what I've gone for this week is, I know Patrick's playing there, and Patrick will probably have a chance. He's about 80 to 1. But Patrick Rogers, I do fancy. He's the headline tip at 28 to 1 uh, for four each way. Uh, you can get up to seven places each way. Um, Patrick Rogers was a really good uh, amateur. He was the world number one. He was a very good player in college. He hasn't really cracked the PGA Tour. Three times he's been second. Um, but he was 12th last week at the Genesis in Riviera at a much tougher event, much tougher field. Uh, and he was 12th. He has form in the Dominican Republic, which is just next door to Puerto Rico. Twice he's played at Puerto Rico. He's played quite well. I think Patrick Rogers is a good each way bet at 28 to 1. Um, I've had even a bit of my own uh, real money, not virtual money, on this uh, Patrick Rogers this week. The other ones, Will Gordon is 40 to 1 for two each way. Will Gordon was a guy who's only 24 years of age, got onto the tour by playing well in just a handful of events last year, including the Travelers Championship, in which he was third. He was 20th in Puerto Rico last year. I mean, he's a big hitter. Um, he's very good with his irons, Will Gordon. I think he's a young, fresh talent that's probably pretty fearless at 40 to 1, Will Gordon. Uh, the third selection, uh, this is a fascinating one for me. Rafael Campos is 175 to 1. He's from Puerto Rico, so he's a local boy. He knows the course better than everybody else. He's been twice in the top 10. Um, he had back issues for a long time. And then last week, he was seventh on the satellite tour, the Corn Ferry Tour. So he's healthy, he's playing well, he's at his local course, he's been placed there before. Rafael Campos is 175 to 1, and he's overpriced in my view. And the stragglers that have had a, a Euro each way on Bo Hostler at 80 to 1 for a Euro each way. Bo Hostler has been twice second on the tour, once at the US Open as a 17 year old. He's only 25. I still think he's got a bit of talent, Bo Hostler, in this weaker field. And a guy who's been completely out of form, but is a horses for courses guy, Sean Stefani, 200 to 1, has been 14th and 6th the last couple of years uh, in Puerto Rico, has got good finishes in these kind of tournaments in the Dominican Republic, Mexico, Cancun and also in Bermuda. So Sean Stefani and Bo Hoster are the stragglers uh, that I'm also selecting this week. But I do like Rafael Campos, Will Gordon, and Patrick Rogers, the headline tip this week. In the Puerto Rico Open, it starts at 11 a.m. Go for it, John. Thanks a million. That's the, this week's virtual insanity from John Duggan. Uh, inside information of the type that you can't get anywhere else. Like uh, somebody is particularly good in the Caribbean weather, there must be something in the wind that they actually like. Seven minutes past nine here this morning on OTB AM. Uh, if you've just joined us, you're very welcome along. You've missed some good stuff. We've had Stephen Ferris on talking about the uh, Ireland team, Emma McInnon talking about her incredible season with Armagh last year and plenty more as well. You'll get the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Hit subscribe to that and we will be in your earballs by 10 o'clock every morning. Uh, here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. You can listen live at noon. It's the Six Nations show. Uh, Neil, Mike McCarthy and Ian McKinley on duty for that one. OTB Gold is the Wexford 56 story with Art Foley and Ned Wheeler. State of the Union, the future of the women's game with Maggie Alfonsi, Ali Donnelly and Wendy Keenan. Our retro panel is Sport and the Rising. That's at 4 o'clock, at 6 o'clock. It's Mick O'Connell at 80. And uh, obviously live tonight, John Giles and Brian O'Driscoll from 7 uh, with Nathan on Thursday night off the ball. Tom Malone is with us now. Tom, good morning to you. How are you? Hey, Ger, How are you? Yeah, good. So we should talk about... Um, John mentioned Danoli's victory uh, in Cheltenham in the 90s when we couldn't buy a win. What, what is it about the Danoli story, apart from the Cheltenham victory, because everybody liked that winner, but what was it that made that story so resonant and therefore this recent passing something that is affecting kind of slightly even beyond the racing community? Yeah, I just think the story of Tom Foley and Danoli is that of you know kind of ordinary people and national hunt racing was always a sort of seen as a small man's game and i mean Danoli and tom foley were the sort of ultimate epitome of that you know they were you know one man tom foley and you know his owner dan o'neill and Danoli. you know he was an ordinary carlo farmer you know before we ever went to bagnellstown to visit willie mullins yard we had tom foley and Danoli, and you know he worked him up a just up a grass hill on his farm. He bought him for less than seven grand from Goffs when he went to go buy another horse. He didn't really have much success before or after with other horses. And, you know, it's just, it was just really, really sad. Denoli, 
it's a bit naff to say he was the people's champion, but that's really what he was. The horse was on the news every night of the week. When he ran, it was just incredible. Uh, obviously, look, everyone says the Cheltenham victory, but actually following that, there were incredible wins at Leopardstown in particular. Um, it's a it's a win in the Hennessy, what was called the Hennessy in 97, when he won. There was over 20,000 people in Leopardstown. I mean, I think it's still the record crowd. And, uh, like... The replay was put on, on, it's worth checking out, it's on um, Racing TV social media last night. You can't hear the commentary over the crowd. It was just phenomenal from Tanoli. And, um, you know, Tom Foley says, I read back a few interviews last night, uh, he said the horse is effectively on three legs back then. He was just the most incredible, clear character of a horse. And Tom Foley was just this absolute everyman um a wonderful wonderful gentleman he was straight talking as well he wasn't you know just happy to be here um i know he wasn't delighted with the way things ended up later on in life and um you know he's definitely isn't happy with the way um trainers kind of have to operate now and you know if a small trainer gets a horse like denoli now they'd have to sell there's just it, otherwise it would just be the most terrible business decision um but again stories like Jake McManus came to him with it with an open check. And I mean, most people, that's their absolute dream scenario, isn't it? But um, Dan O'Neill and Tom Foley said no, they kept him. And like the horse wasn't straightforward to train. It's not like the, he ran a lot, but he had plenty of injuries. And uh, he came back from those injuries. And like I say, the most brilliant comeback from those injuries was the 97 Hennessy win at Leopardstown. Okay. So uh, again, I think it's that kind of, it's that bit where a horse crosses over and the people behind the horse ultimately are the ones who caused the horse to cross over and, and that's what we've lost this week. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we're going to be cheering on Irish horses at Cheltenham in three weeks' time and, you know, they're going to be owned by millionaires and billionaires and bankers. They're not really owned by Carlo Farmers, you know. And, and there, there is that difference in connection now. Like, Gordon Ellis is going to send 56 horses to Cheltenham. You know, uh, it's just, th these are like armies and battalions and huge businesses they're not a farmer and his one horse and the first time he goes to Cheltenham is the first time he's ever in an airplane and he's worried about the horse getting sick and he gets sick himself with the nerve getting off the plane you know those things don't happen anymore and that's why that's one of the multiple reasons why um it, it was such a great story okay um we have had confirmation that there will be no amateur riders at Cheltenham Patrick Mullins is on the back of one of the papers today talking about going professional is this like golf if you turn pro if you earn certain mountain that's it you can't darken the threshold of an amateur tournament ever again for the rest of your lives or is there a bit of wiggle room here what's there is a bit of wiggle room, but I mean, in the case of, you know, Derek O'Connor, Jamie Codd, Patrick Mullins, I mean, it'd be a kind of ludicrous amount of wiggle room where if I would be allowed them to go back as amateurs, it would, uh, it just wouldn't look good. Um, you are allowed to become an, a term professional and then obviously, you know, if it doesn't work out for you, if you have less than um, 20 odd winners or something like that, you are allowed to go back to the amateur ranks, say, to pursue a career in point to points but i mean obviously these boys are so far beyond that point of not riding winners so it would it would uh, it would have to be seen as a kind of a gesture on behalf of the ihrb um patrick Mullins has said he'll consider it i don't think i don't think jamie Carter or derek o'connor are going to do it i mean they make their living from point to points they're both agents for Goffs and uh, Tadis Ireland respectively. And I mean, yes, they're amateur riders and they're absolutely brilliant jockeys, but, you know, they need to worry about where they actually make the money over the next few years. And that is essentially from the point to point sphere. And I mean that in a, in a recruitment sense, like they will be at every single meeting and then they'd be trying to get, say, the best of the point to point talent to come through the sales ring, whether it be at Goffs or Tadisols. Uh, when it comes to those big spring sales. So what, what, while Patrick sorry, may do it, Jamie yeah. Codd won't. What's the difference between a, a, a professional rider and an amateur rider? Explain to us, do, do the amateur riders not get paid? Do they get paid differently? Do they, are you allowed to earn money? Um, what, what is the crack? Expressly, amateur riders don't get paid. I mean, there's no, there is no set fee. I mean, obviously, uh, owners do um, gift things to them and the like and um you know they can invoice for services rendered and things like that as well but it's it, essentially they do not get paid but you know say someone like jamie Codd, he is an agent for tattersalls ireland that is his job and obviously that falls under as he would be point he rides at point to points so that well normally when they're on every sort of sunday between you know october and march and in that you will come across all the talent in the point to point spheres 
then as an agent in for the sales company, he'll be trying to, you know, recruit those particular owners if they want to go sell the horses to make sure that they go through the likes of, uh, of Tattersalls and that. But uh, especially they do not get paid. But obviously, you know, if uh, if um, if an amateur rider rides a big race winner at, uh, at Cheltenham, owners would often... Um, you know, thank them in whatever way they do. Uh, and is that all above board? Are you not allowed to do that? Or uh, so, uh, like, as far as I know, again, and this is the these are this is some of the kind of um, stuff that's very opaque for outsiders. Uh, if you're a jockey and you're a professional jockey, you get a set amount of the winnings. It's a fixed yes percent. It's, is it ten percent? Yeah, I think it's eight or ten percent. Okay, something along those lines. Yeah, and the amateur rider will get paid literally nothing, even if the horse wins, like a the Grand National. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, officially, anyway, and right. then I guess it's up to whatever level of discretion or uh, generosity or the owner comes up with to, to decide to and that's, you know, gift something to and, an amateur. And rider that's between. private between them and the taxman, obviously, whatever. But it's not the the you, you don't lose your status if if say I'm an amateur jockey and you're my owner and I win the Grand National for you and you go here, I'm going to give you the eight percent that I would have given a professional rider that doesn't affect my status it's it's nobody's business essentially yeah it's yeah. not frowned upon that, or that would be the okay uh no it's not frowned upon uh no it's, it's not frowned upon but um if if you know if in a sort of an official payment were to be made that would be you know it, it's something that's always been kind of a, a sort of gray area and it generally you know it's it is very much at the discretion of connections as to what to but i wouldn't lose my amateur, amateur status rather. or anything if you decided to pay me for that no, 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 no. Okay. So why do people stay amateur? I don't really understand. What's the difference? Why wouldn't you just go professional? Well, the, uh, well, the, the, the thing about amateur, particularly in Ireland, why you would stay amateur is to be able to ride in point to point and to be able to ride in bumpers. So Patrick Mullins obviously is a very privileged position, but if you, like, so he will ride all of Willie's best horses in bumpers. Um, so he gets to ride them, whereas, you know, he, and he weighs, like, he weighs nearly 12 stone as well. So, like, I mean, the only real classification of race he can ride in on a regular basis without putting himself through absolute turmoil uh, weight-wise, you know what I mean? So right. for riders like Jamie Codd, like the top point-to-point -point riders, like, you know, they will have ridden all those horses that come through the point-to-point -point sphere, they will have ridden them at the early stages in their career. Um, and again, it's same for Patrick. He will have ridden all those great horses in bumpers. So you do get to ride a better class of horse if you're a top amateur jockey versus whereas, you know, if you're a slightly... Like, what's Jamie Codd rather be? Get to ride all the best Gordon Elliott horses in bumpers or be sort of third and fourth choice and then having to waste away and then having to give up his actual job. You know, so it, it's career decisions as well. Okay, know? that makes sense, that makes sense. So I think hopefully that we've explained that to people because that was always one of those things like, well, I don't really understand what the difference or how it works, but okay, good stuff. Champion Hurdle and Mare's Hurdle, we want to talk about this and we're, it's no coincidence that we're bracketing these together because Epitant and Honeysuckle are both mares, but actually they're at the top of the market for the Champion Hurdle as well. Yeah, it's kind of weird. The Mare's Hurdle, um, we might just send as little time as possible on the Mare's Hurdle. If Honeysuckle runs in that, she wins. It's been kind of rendered almost irrelevant now because, you know, Benny Dejeu is not going to run. So the kind of angle we would have had was, you know, those two clashing uh, once again, you know, Benny Dejeu and Honeysuckle. If Honeysuckle turns up in this, she wins. Um, and, you know, obviously, Willie Mullins has a really strong hand with the likes of Concertista in a, in a race he absolutely dominates. The champion hurdle is fascinating. I know, I know we are all aboard the Honeysuckle bandwagon because what a mare, you know, 10 in a row. And this, you know, after last year's win in the mares and the way she's performed since, it would seem like a terrible decision just from a comp competition point of view not to let her have a go in the champion hurdle this year. She's round a bit favourite. Epitant then appointed when last seen. She's the reigning champion. And then last weekend, the most incredible run by Goshen, who you may remember last year in the in the triumph hurdle was set to win by about 25 lengths he came to the last hurdle and the freakiest accident happened where he jumped it clear but and i've never seen this before never heard before never even come across it in any way shape or form his front and hind hooves caught kind of like this and so his feet got caught causing to stumble and he fell when he would have won the triumph hurdle by 25 lengths it's taken a while to recover from then but 
he bounced back in absolutely spectacular style, uh, which sort of kind of give him a line of form that will put him up with Bober there. So he's now really bounced back into the market. He would have been about you know 12 or 16 to 1 this time last week. He's now clear third favourite at 4 and 5 to 1. Then we've got kind of the Willie Mullins brigade, uh, but it's an absolutely fascinating race. And again, your, your friend, you got Sharj in there. He's probably one that's slightly overpriced. And Willie Mullins threw an absolute curveball in during the week that he's going to run a horse called a James de Burley on his first start for Willie Mullins. He's a French import. He's also halved in price this week. Um, he's at about, he's sort of 12 to 1 in the place, having been readily available at 50 to 1 again this time last week. So uh, it's a big move for him. But yeah, Honeysuckle, V Epitant, the two big mares at the top of the market, and then Goshen has just made it far more interesting since Saturday. Okay, and what was the story of the Mango Gloves? Oh, that was uh, appreciated, yeah. Um, so again, Willie Mullins at a press call, and uh, he was asked about appreciated. He's obviously warm more the favourite for the... Um, for the, uh, the the supreme novice's hurdle, and uh, William Moses asked, "Well, how is he?" he goes, "Yeah, well, he's just cost me a pair of gloves." So, uh, appreciated is in such good form, he managed to basically undress himself in his stable. Um, um, so, horses when they're in the stables, they wear these big rugs that are belted up, and they're obviously really incredibly heavy, and they're difficult to take off. And uh, appreciated managed to, without opening any straps take off the rug himself, basically grabbed it with his mouth over kind of his back and pulled it over his own head. And Willie Mullins went in to go and sort them out. And uh, he basically pulled the gloves out of Willie's pocket and ate them. Right. So <laughs> generally you want a horse to show its character and its well-being in a sort of how active it is in its stable when it should be relaxing. So when it looks at those things, uh, appreciated is in very, very good form, having been able to, first of all, undress himself and then go and uh, when Willie went to go and put the rugs back on him, he went and ate one of Willie's kind of one of Willie's looks is having these famous sheepskin gloves. Anyway, appreciated put that uh, paid to a pair of them. So we'll need a new one that I'm sure he'll be well able to afford if he docks up in the Supreme. Tom, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Tom along with our weekly Cheltenham countdown here on OTBAM. If you've missed anything, a reminder, of course, you can catch it all back on our YouTube channel. Hit subscribe on that, and anytime we go live, we'll ping you a little message. You can listen back on the OTBAM podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, the uh, OTB Sports app is the best place for that. We're going to be remembering the late Gary Halpin in the company of Keith Wood, Mick Galway and Nick Popowa from around about half past nine. But Sue Murphy joins us now for our TV picks uh, in just a moment, actually. Um, yeah, so what are you watching at the moment? Sue's with us. Sue, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? Where are we starting? Um, I think the big one this week is, well, it actually came out last week, but it's, it's, I think a lot of people are watching it and it's a word of mouth thing, is I care a lot. That's on Amazon Prime. I don't know if you've watched this yet. It's amazing. Like, it shouldn't be amazing because it's a really, really dark comedy. Very, very dark. Um, Rosamund Pike plays this woman called Marla who basically makes all her money off... She's a, a con woman. Makes all her money off uh, putting old people in old folks' homes. And she has, like, this network of people, doctors who are willing to get, like, emergency orders to put people <laughs> in these homes. She pays off the people who run the homes... It's this whole massive operation and she's making a lot of money off the top of it. But unfortunately, she messes with the wrong woman. One of the women that she puts into the, the home is connected to a, a gangster uh, played by Peter Dinklage, brilliantly by Peter Dinklage. And it's just like, I mean, do you ever watch something and you're like, I can't root for anyone in this film because you're all despicable people, every single one of you, even the woman Succession. that's put into the home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's so enjoyable. Like it shouldn't be enjoyable. It shouldn't be funny. There were a couple of times I I properly laughed out loud. And I was like, I really I really shouldn't be laughing at this film. And it's quite controversial actually because the the reviews of it, critics are saying that it's amazing. And a lot of the audience, if you want to run tomatoes, I think the audience review is something like thirty percent. Wow. And the critics review is eighty one. Like, you I critics, you're all up your own asses. That's the problem. I'm Too intellectual, critic, but... <laughs> nonsensical nonsense. That's it. Too snobby. But uh, no, I think people are just finding it difficult to watch because it is so dark and okay. it's trying to be so funny by, while being so dark. And it's it one season, how many episodes? No, that's film. It's oh, film. It's film. So it's okay. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Rosamund Pike is just exceptional in it. And I don't think we've seen her being really this good since Gone Girl, but she's vicious in it. Very, very vicious. Okay, so I Care A Lot, a movie on Amazon yeah. Prime. How long right. is it? 
It's about two hours. Yeah, it is about two hours. So I mean, not give us these so, ninety-minute movies. What's with the two hours nonsense? Like who? I know. Who has I the know. attention span? You get to that last half hour, and you're like, really? There's another half an hour of this left. I didn't Wrap feel it. it. I honestly didn't feel it. And I'm one of those people that has to watch something for an hour and a half and pause and watch the next half an hour the next day. And I couldn't wait to get back to it. Like it, it's brilliant. Really, really good. I mean, an hour and a half into a film, the bottle of wine is finished. You can't remember any of that last half hour. <laughs> like. <laughs> Don't they know yeah. there's a bloody pandemic on? <laughs> I understand. I actually totally agree with you most of the time. Once something goes past 19 minutes, you've lost me. But okay. honestly, if it's good and the characters are good, it's worth spending time with. Bloodlands. Yeah, I'm obsessed with this. Um, so I watched the first episode of this last Sunday and then watched last night with my husband, who kept giving out that they were over-explaining what was happening in Belfast. But I think they have to give the backstory of what happened in the 90s and the peace deal and everything. Um, this is Jed Mercurio, who I'm slightly obsessed with, um, who's behind Line of Duty and Bodyguard. This is his latest series, and it's set in Belfast, stars James Nesbitt, and he plays a guy called Tom Brannock, who's been working uh, as a PSNI officer for 20 years. And he worked in a case called Goliath back in the 90s, and it was something that they kind of had to brush under the carpet when they thought one of their own police officers was a serial killer. Um, but they couldn't come out with it because the peace deal was on the table. So uh, he's he's got a personal connection to that. They, they actually, if you read about this, they give away something that happens about twenty five minutes into the first episode. So don't read anything about it because if you're just watching it cold, it's it's kind of a shock to find out something about twenty minutes in. Okay, one um, one quick issue with anything that's on BBC. If you miss it, yeah, we can't get the yeah. BBC player here unless you do the VPN malarkey. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's that. Like, I actually am really annoyed that I missed it last week because I usually I just tape whatever new series is on at nine o'clock at BBC because it's usually brilliant. And there wasn't really a lot of talk about this. They're still really pushing Line of Duty, like it's all over BBC at the moment. And yet, this is the new series from BBC from the creator of Line of Duty. Why aren't you pushing it? Yeah. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it is VPN. Yeah. Oh, and you're good at that malarkey. <laughs> at trying to circumvent the rules in order to get some good BBC <laughs> content in front of my eyes. Is that what you're suggesting? Pretty much, yeah. Give, tell, us, stuff, yeah. tell us how we do B it. BBC iPlayer has constantly defeated me. Uh, I've, <laughs> it, used, it used to be... VPNs ain't what they used to be. I, I get nostalgic for the days when VPNs were a good old Chrome extension. But uh, not anymore. Yeah. You've got to download software nowadays and all that. And I'm just too old for that sort of crap. So I'm beyond the point of... Rewatching stuff on BBC, I've been defeated. Wow, that's unbelievable. Well, you can buy a VPN. I feel like I'm giving away illegal information here. You can buy a VPN that'll let you do it, but BBC is notoriously difficult to break into. They're they clever. Kick they, you out. they kick yeah. the VPNs off. They they know what yeah. they're doing. Uh, so you mentioned uh, Jed Mercurio. He is mm. the creator of Line of Duty, which is now apparently on Netflix as well. Yeah, so season five is on it. Now they, they regularly put up season one to four. They've taken it down at the moment because they're rerunning it on BBC. So it's on BBC and Savage. And have you seen Light of Duty? No. Oh, I think you'll love it. I like it. It'd probably be hard enough to get a hold of at the moment, but once it goes on to Netflix again, it's it's brilliant. It's a brilliant cop drama. And I think it's a level above everything else when it comes to kind of a mystery cop thing. The writing is brilliant and the characters are really good. But this season, I think it's season three. There's one episode that is one of the best episodes of, of TV I've ever seen. It's really, it's like full attention and you're not quite sure what's going to happen or how it's going to end. And they keep you guessing all the time, all the way through it, because it's all about like, who is the Ben Coppers, as Adrian Dunbar keeps calling them. It's just excellent. And he he also did Bodyguard. That was the one that was on my list for this week because it's on Netflix as well. And again, just brilliant TV. Like, Keely Hawes is really good in that. Yet again, she seems to be in all of his work, you know? There was a couple that they had out last year that actually weren't that good, uh, that Netflix yeah. was pushing hard. Yeah, cardiac arrest. No, it was, there was some guy that was like, this guy, he's, uh, and it was the writer of it, and actually they ended up really being a waste of time. Um, I need to uh, come prepared better next week and have a look that up before we... <laughs> before I start blathering on about it, like my grandmother. Remember that thing with the man that was shit? Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Okay, You've so... You've become that thing, the, the slash that Norm said it was going to be just old people talking about TV. Bodyguard. So, yeah, Bodyguard is brilliant. Um, it's it's another one of those, uh, like, British drama, cop drama things. But again, it's just, lev like, the level of tension in it is absolutely amazing. And it it's just, it centers around a cop who... Uh, ends up being a bodyguard for one of the ministers in cabinet and uh, she her life is constantly under threat and 
he has to protect her, but he has all of this stuff going on in his private life as well. That's that's leading him to be quite vulnerable and a target for a lot of people. It's just, again, it's just layered with tension. Like the first episode of this, there's a scene on the train where he's trying to get somebody to disconnect a bomb that they've got attached to them. And honest to God, you won't be able to breathe for the entire the entire scene. It's brilliantly written. Really, really, really good. I totally recommend it. Okay. How many episodes are a movie? I think, I think there's about four... No, six. I think there's six in The Bodyguard. Yeah. And The Line of Duty is five series and it, it's usually five to six episodes depending. I think the new series is seven. The new one's coming out. Okay. Uh, you've watched some more of The Office? I didn't. You didn't? Okay. <laughs> I swore that I was going to and then I didn't and I'm really sorry, Owen. This is The I American like Office. Issue. Yeah, I feel yeah. like it's an issue. Yeah, I mean, look, you, do you really feel like you've missed out? Here goes Jer. Here, here, go, here goes Jer <laughs> on his uh, anti-American office ranting and go for it. Do you, you feel know, like you've missed let's out? Just get, get it out of your system. Too much. Uh, Did you, you don't like it, sir? I, it's grand. It's not the like life-changing moment that's... I, it, at some point, Owen will look back and go, yeah, it was okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when is no, that I moment going to happen? I like last week were just like totally convinced this is the greatest thing ever, but I actually went and watched the Britney Spears documentary instead. I know that's bad, but it was very good. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> seen it yet, but it's on the list. Uh, WandaVision, I'm seeing lots of people tuning out of WandaVision saying that it's actually rubbish. Oh, I'm really enjoying it. Okay. I like. Uh, I can't wait for the new episodes to go up every week. It is slowly starting to become the superhero thing, and you can see that they're starting to line up another film very, very, very quickly. But it's still very interesting. I still want to get to the end of it and find out what's happening. And I do like that they're only doing. I know you hate this, but they're only doing one episode a week. I like yeah, that they no just thanks. do that. Uh, yeah, I love it. No, to, technology's moved on to the point where we don't need to do that anymore. It's a complete waste of time and anachronistic, nonsensical. Not BS. The way TV was meant to be watched. No, yeah. not at all. Absolutely, you. the complete opposite. Uh, you started married at first sight, Owen. Yeah, I'm like scrolling through the top rated TV shows here on IMDb. I see Planet Earth, Band of Brothers, Breaking Bad, Chernobyl, The Wire. I don't see married at first sight here, which is an absolute and utter disgrace and is a war crime from everybody on IMDb who gave this anything less than 10 out of 10. Is it this good? Is the greatest television show right. and the great, greatest artistic achievement in the history of humankind. Married at First Sight, season six, Australia. Watch it. You will be hooked forever. It is absolutely sensational. My number one tip for anybody who is tempted to get involved in Married at First Sight, any, any future people looking to, to get Married at First Sight, the one tip is hope to God that the woman you are marrying does not have an older brother. This is, this is the story of the older brother. The territorial older brother is the story of Married at First Sight. I have not known drama like Married at First Sight with a territorial older brother. It is absolutely magnificent. The tension when the camera pans for the first time to older brother X or Y and the drone sounding, and you just know that this is going to be better than the end of the usual suspects. That is how good Married at First Sight is. It is sublime television. Everybody needs to hook it to their ends immediately. All right, good stuff, Owen. Uh, I suppose uh, the name are Big Brothers of the World. Um... Sure, look, what are you going to do? OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. My thanks to Sue. She's with us every Thursday, giving you some recommendations. Um, that is it for us for now. We're going to be uh, bringing you some Gary Halpin uh, recollections from Nick Popperwell, Keith Wood and Mick Galway in just a moment. I want to tell you what's coming up on tomorrow's show. Shane Hannan joins Adrian Barry from Half Seven. Rugby with Ronan O'Gara and Alan Quinlan together. Jordan Brown after stunning Ronnie O'Sullivan last weekend in the Welsh Open and we'll be exclusively launching a brand new song on the show. Do not miss it. Right, uh, let's take some time to spend some time in the company of good friends of Gary Halpin who loved the man and who who loved the person that he was on and off the pitch. It's Nick Popperwell, Keith Wood and Mick Galway. Well, terrible news today. Gary Halpin has passed away at the age of just 55. Irish international a debut back in 1990, played at two World Cups. There was the famous try and the even more famous celebration against New Zealand in 95. His club career included a great stint at London Irish, seven years there. He was the club's first captain in the professional area, moved on to Harlequins and finished up at Leinster. He represented Ireland as well at the Hammer. He was at the 1987 World Championships, no less, and uh, the news which has come through over the last 24 hours has been greeted just with a sense of shock and great sadness. And to give you a sense of Gary Halpin, he was at a road show with us in 2018 and he was holding court as only he could in many ways. And uh, we'll pick it up here. We've been playing him a video of that try against New Zealand in 95 and obviously his very famous celebration. And well, he took it away. Ha, ha, ha.
Look, look into my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see the way my hair was flowing as I, <laughs> as I went over the try. The most amazing thing about that try, first of all, is the fact I caught it. Remember? Yeah. Absolutely. And you see what we've been practicing yeah. that for about two uh, years. Uh, every, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but what people don't understand, like in that game, Lomo was there. I sidestepped Lomo, Lomo three times during the course of that game, and that's true. The only problem was he was the one carrying the ball at that stage. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing I, I realize, because you know, when you're in rugby, you know, we over here it's very easy to appreciate rivalries. But you know, we, everybody, we got that big rivalry against the English, and it works so much. Irish teams get an extra 50, you know, 10, 15 percent into restrooms, but you can't believe how much the South Africans hate the New Zealanders, right? <laughs> and after that summer, I took, a, after that, that uh, World Cup, I took a trip around South Africa and Zimbabwe, and I couldn't go into a pub and put my hand into my pocket because <laughs> South Africans, I must have put on about four stone, well, like two stone in the summer after that because this, the South Africans absolutely love that whole thing, you know? So, I mean, what Andy Warhol said, everybody's, what, 15 seconds of fame? There you go, that was mine, so it was oh, good fun. You still haven't explained why you did it, though. Why did you give... Oh, sorry, you, sorry. You, was that, was sorry, that aimed sorry. at the New Zealand You know, every time I see him... I, oh, sorry. It's Sean Fitzpatrick. I, every time I see him, I still want to give him the finger. You know what I mean? I find him... You know, he, uh, he, he, for, he's a great player and all that. Tonight's a prize guest. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you are. Gary Halpin, Nathan Murphy asking the questions, and alongside him was Mick Galway that evening. Mick, you're very welcome. Thanks, Joe. And Nick Popwell with us as well. Hiya, Nick. Hiya, Joe. So, Mick, uh, I dare say three years ago you didn't expect we'd be having this conversation. Shocking news. Shocking news. Absolutely shocking news. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just unbelievable. Like, these are, these are tough old times for everybody. But then, you know, you hear of somebody who you, I suppose, you, you, you were in the trenches with and, you know, you shared great times with him. And particularly, I suppose, with, with Gary, you know, it wasn't, I suppose, wasn't, it wasn't all about what we won, but it was the crack we had and it was the, the fun we had and the camaraderie. And, yeah, I was, you know, I was there that night, Lauren Dolphin, and just to give you an idea of the fella, you know what I mean? I could close my eyes and just imagine I was still there, but um, he had the place lit up, you know what I mean? If you go on with Gary Halpin, you know whether you want to be second fiddle, but um, nobody has ever, would ever take on that man, you know what I mean? And um, to hear of his passing today is, is just awful. It kind of brings back the whole Axel thing again, and, and unfortunately it's... it's it's a shame that I'd be talking to, including Poppy there, I was talking to the amount of players today and players that we would have played with, and, you know what I mean? And um, it just brings the whole thing back again, but very sad. Similar to Axel, um, another good man gone, and no doubt way too young. Phil Danaher said, Mick, when you were in his company, you were happier. And I think we got a glimpse of that, that in that clip that we played. I mean, I don't think you could be too downbeat around that kind of energy. What are your stronger memories of being in the Irish team with them? Well, I suppose he was the right man to have around the Irish team, and when, particularly in the early days, and Poppy was there as well in the nineties. From the nineties on, it wasn't the most, I suppose, successful time in Irish rugby. And we did. I remember we were the tour of New Zealand, and you know, we we got a few hidings, and then we we had a few good games. But um, you know, like there was times when, you know, you come off the pitch and and you'd be wrecked, and uh, you know, we probably would have played after getting a, a hiding. But there was one game, Poppy. You might remember this. I think it could have been the second test, but. Uh, you know, we were inside the dressing room and, and, and like we were just shattered and New Zealand were after putting 60 points on us, you know what I mean? But Gary, was, somebody had to say something and Gary turned around and said, my God, lads, there's some rugby men, you know what I mean? It just broke, <laughs> it just broke the silence. You know, if, if anybody else said it, they would have been killed. <laughs> Gary had that way of getting away with it. And by God, it was the importance of the Irish team back then because um, as I said, and Poppy will, will say, we weren't, well, look, we weren't that bad and we had some great wins, but um, Gary was a very important part of that team. And it probably wasn't for his benefit, to be honest. Gollum, I was talking to Noisy Noel there probably about an hour ago. Yeah. And I was just saying, and listen, let's be honest, the most unsuccessful period in Irish rugby was the 10 years we were stuck in it. Um, <laughs> and that's probably fact. Yeah. But I think when we went over New Zealand, was that a nine or 10 week tour? Yeah. Yeah. And to be basically away from home for nine or ten weeks in one of the most miserable bloody countries in the world 
<laughs> amongst probably the most miserable people in the world, um, which is grand, whatever. But, you know, it's just horrendous. And to be able to literally have a match, be hoped, have a few scoops in the in the dressing room, get on a bus, have a sing song, and, you know, I can still see it. Gary get up to the bus and Gary would be up there and he'd have us in stitches and that was it. All ready for the next training session the next morning, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he was probably as 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 you know, he was the unofficial uh, star of, of of the tour, but like it wasn't on the pitch, it was what he did off the pitch was was, was was very important to all of us. But um, you know, what a character. I was looking up, I actually met him two weeks ago, you know what I mean? And like he's in Kilkenny, I'm in Kilkenny, but like like nothing changed. And I was with two friends of mine and I said to Gary, now to the story the camera repeated on radio, I said, Gary, tell him about the time, such and such. And it's two boys and not, and like they'd never met him before. And I think that just summed it up for me. You know what I mean? A great last memory to have of him. Great last opportunity to, to, to just meet him and have the crack once more. And I think anybody, and you, you mentioned about Philip Danher, you mentioned about anybody. Anybody who was lucky enough to be in his presence ever would come away feeling better about himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 100%. And I, I had a... I tell you, I rang him last week because Frano had been on to me saying, listen, you know, we, we're going to have a 30 reunion um, for the second World Cup. And I said, oh, gee, that sounds like a good idea. And uh, you aren't anyway. And I end up, I rang Gary, because I think I think it was Gary's birthday last week, was it? It could have been, yeah, because I know he's, he's older than me, but he's, he's just 55, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it was last. So I rang him up to say happy birthday. And then, as usual, 45 minutes later, <laughs> and, you, you know, you just laugh. I mean, at our age, you don't laugh. You know what I mean? It's everything's so bloody serious. And you just, it was like schoolboy stuff. And, you know, you can't, you can't repeat what you were talking about. But it was back when you were 25 yeah. or 22 and you were stuck in some dive in downtown Chicago doing whatever. And, um, no, it's just, you know, you just come, you always came away feeling better and just saying, you know something, why don't I ring that chap? Yeah. Every other week because he just cheered you up. He was better than any bloody antidepressant have. And I think this is important too today. It's easy to be sunken, but he'd be looking down at us saying, Listen, lads, get on with it, you know what I mean? And have a laugh, you know, don't you dare all I mean, Shane Byrne rang me this morning, um, don't know what time it was, eight o'clock or four to eight. And I saw the call coming through, so I, I blocked it because every time Shane rings, he's looking for something. So after three times then I picked it up and he said, Listen. Yeah. Did you hear the news? And I said, nope. He said, Gary passed away. And I said, oh, please. And I'd say, I'd say I cried for an hour. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's it now. So I'm going to just get on. So, but no, every time, you know, the phone calls, it's just larger than life. People, like people always say, you know, somebody dies, no one says a horrible thing. But <laughs> genuine. You couldn't say a bad thing about Gary. Genuine. <laughs> he was just... Jesus, you know, he always picked you up. He always, you know, if there was somebody there in a corner on their own, he'd be over there bringing them into a conversation. You know, he's just one of a kind, you know. Certainly. How did anyway, you hear, Mick? Let's not be too morose either, you know. No, yeah, I, yeah. You. No, I heard this morning. I was at home and, and um, um, actually my wife, Joan, heard about it. And, and, you know, she said it to me. And I, as, as I was picking up my phone, yeah, I saw all the missed calls from people that wouldn't usually ring you early in the morning. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I knew it was early in the morning, Gollum, about half an hour. Ah, it was about six, Papa. You know yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was about eight. I think I was eight. But um, no, it was, just, it was just awful, you know. Um, and it's just, you know, because I, Gary, even though he, like, Gary spent a lot of time, I suppose, away from, 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 I suppose, home in Kilkenny because he went to Rockwell first, then he was in, in the UK, then he was in athletics, he was in New York, but like he's, the people around Kilkenny have a great time for him, you know what I mean? And, and, and they'd often ask me, how's Gary, did you see him lately? And of course, he's been living here the last number of years, even though he's work, he was working in, um, he was working in, 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 um, in Ross Gray, but um, my God, it's just, he's just a, a huge, huge loss. And, and, and I suppose, particularly as Poppy said, to, like, to, to, to fellas, that, that would have played with him back in the day and it's always good to have a connection and you know to think back on, on, on maybe on, on on happier times and better times and, but it's certainly when all of us are getting older and we're trying to put the pieces together certainly Gary would be um, a big loss out of that because you know 90% of the stories revolved around him you know and uh, if we're ever lucky enough when this pandemic 
pandemic is over to have a few reunions will certainly be um, regaining great stories about Kerry. And that's something I'm really looking forward to, but unfortunately, he won't be there to enjoy it. Mm. I hadn't fully appreciated, Nick, to the extent to which he was the centre of the fun and games, the heartbeat of the team off the pitch in many ways. Yeah, and, and you know what? And, and you know what? What we loved over the last number of years, Pop, you did a few as well. The legends matches. You know what I mean? Like we didn't go and play the legends matches to get hurt. And to, 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 you know what I mean? Okay, look, it was a great cause. Let me get one thing straight. It was for the, the injured players, just. But God, the, the main reason we went there was just for the crack and, and the catch up, and particularly for like Gary. You know what I mean? Mm. But no, Nick, are you talking about the legends matches that. or the internationals? What's that? You talk about the Legends matches or the international? Oh, no, the Legends matches, of course, the Legends matches. But what I loved about it was the younger fellas maybe just, just had finished playing and they never came across Gary before and they're, they're looking at him and they're saying, is this fella for real? Like, you know what I mean? And then they can see a bit of the, I suppose, I suppose the old school and Gary was, yeah, like, like the rest of us, Bobby, Gary was around the, the start of, of the professional game, but he certainly had the, the old school attitude and he certainly had the... the, the you know, the game was, was when the game was over, the game was over. Then it was time yeah. to, to mix with your mates. And I think maybe but that's let's something be honest, that's God, it, was a, really, it was a tough player. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Oh, my you know, God. He was says, tough oh, as oh, God, he was a great chap. And he was this. But by Jesus, you know, no better man. I know, you know. It's probably second yeah, to the law with you the wouldn't boost, last you know, to poppy. You know the way fellas now are running into rocks and the they can't even they, they have to watch every step. Gary would launch himself from fifty yards. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he certainly, he certainly would, wouldn't, wouldn't survive at the moment. But that even was, when we were training, Gollop, in those days you'd be training and you know, the Irish sessions they were tough, but every time either yourself, Gary, or me were on the ground and somebody was going up, yeah, you just automatically stood on him. Just no, no badness. Yeah, just yeah. kind of a reminding shock that listen, you know, we're with you. And again, it was kind of childish stuff because you'd stand on a fella and like if somebody is standing you and you weren't around, you weren't allowed to scream. You know what I mean? And you weren't allowed to give up. <laughs> but you had you had a license to go back at them, which made it great. You know what I mean? <laughs> Obviously talented, Nick. I mean, if he's competing at the World Championships in the hammer throw and then is an Irish international at two World Cups. Yeah, well, I think I actually I was in a little um, school called Newtown in Waterford, and Gary at the time was in Rockwell, and I know we played hockey there, he played rugby, and he was, I think I think he was on Irish schools, Gala, wasn't he? Probably for one or two years. He was. He was Irish schools as well. Yeah, we'll say with with, with, with say Lindenine and all those lads. Yeah, yeah. he was certainly Irish schools. Yeah, but and you know, so he was, and he was an athlete. Jesus, he could, you know. You'd be doing star jumps, and I'd probably be myself and Mick would probably be just about be able to put a bit of paper between your feet and the ground. And Gary was, you know, he was fees, he was flexible when we didn't know what flexible meant because he had a huge amount of training. Um, well, but so I mean, he, was, he was in I think, a scholarship in America, Jim, but like he was there in, 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 in New York with one of those big clubs or whatever. Now, he and, trained uh, with them. Um, you won what you call her, it's very. Sonia O'Sullivan, I think, and himself were in the same yeah, college. Yeah, they could have been they? around the same, same, same time. Yeah, yeah, certainly. That's the first time Sonia O'Sullivan's been referred to as your one. But anyway. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> I think so as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so listen, uh, lads. I, I guess I mean, it's, it's such a, a lovely, genuine, warm tribute you've you've paid him. I, I get a sense, Nick, as well. You've got a nice bond that '90s group, that '90s crew. You're 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 friendly. Well, I think it was a very lonely time in Irish rugby. Like literally. You were heading away from home for, and let's be honest with you, there was a few people decided they wouldn't travel to the likes of New Zealand for whatever, nine or ten weeks. And, you know, I'm not talking That's about right. anyone in particular, Frano, but, you know, it was, Frano, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was grim. It was because, say, like, it was a time of the year when it was wet, wet and it was, you know, like, it you, was, know, you know, but Bobby, it was, it was, as you say, it was hard at the time, but it was a great to look back on it now. And you know, I have said, geez, at least we did it, and then we were there. And ah, we might have been so brilliant. We have and the I mean, memories. At the end, we nearly beat New Zealand. Nearly beat New Zealand. We nearly beat, I suppose, Absolutely. Australia as well. Yeah, but yeah. We, I genuinely like we nearly beat New Zealand in the first test out there. So we and did. Unfortunately, yeah. I think the rest started looking at himself and saying, lads. What am I doing wrong here? This isn't going to script. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and I'm not going to get my two week holiday. So bing, bing, know, bing, bing, and bing. So uh, no. but yeah, but you know, a strong bugger because obviously, I think when you're a prop, I'm as a loose head prop, 
totally reliant on obviously you're totally reliant on the other side mm. because you can be as good as you like. Don't forget your second round. Don't forget your second round. Don't forget the injury room, you know. I was going to say that, Gollop, yeah. In all fairness, yeah. It was like with Gollop behind you, it was like sitting in a comfortable armchair. You never had to do anything. Okay. But, um, yeah. Ah, it's, it's, it's just. Sad day. Sad day yeah. overall. You, you know just what I mean? can't, I yeah. It just, whatever, it's, about, it's, whatever about us, um, I suppose it's Carl and his, and, his, and his kids, his three kids, and his brothers. Yeah, and he, sisters, he was you know what I mean? last week. I think Bentley just got engaged. That's and, right. Um, That's right. Right. So you had Leone Lenkins. I just, you know, yeah, absolutely yeah. distraught. Yeah. You know, without, you know, how, yeah. how do you even. Oh. No, devastation. Uh, condolences yeah. to all and, and, and thanks fellas okay. for coming on. I know it's a, a tough day to, to come on and talk about it when it's so fresh. Nick Popwell, Mick Galway, thanks very much, gents. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Uh, Keith Wood is with us, was listening in. Hi, Keith. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm uh, well. I'm. Under the circumstances, I'm, I'm better than you guys. A, a sad day for all of you. It's very clear. Yeah, it's 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 very sad. Hard to hard to process. Um, uh, it's not the sort of call you want to have first thing in the morning. They say there's no good call late at night or early in the morning. And um, uh, Ben Taker, his son, called me about half six this morning, um, just to to. And he's, I mean, as a young fellow, he's a class act, but. Um, Anyway, so we were both crying at first first thing this morning, uh, having a conversation over it, and it's uh, yeah, it's been it's it's just sad. It's hard to process, and just you're just down with the whole idea that um, um, that there's a sadness. There's a there's a fairly large hole missing in the in the um, in, in the earth at the moment. I mean, the boys were talking about him as for fun. He was the best stand up comic I knew. Um, he was truly, truly side-splittingly funny when he got the chance. The second he got it, and he had the chance all the time because he took over the microphone. Um, and our relationship, like I started at the time, the guys were talking, so I got into the squad in 92, and Gary had been in there, I think, for about a year beforehand. And he took me under his wing. And, um, I mean, the amount of crack that we ended up having, the amount of fun we had was just was extraordinary, truly extraordinary. Mm. Did your London years coincide? Absolutely. And like, it's funny, I, I think my memories of Gary go, go back to sitting on the bench for Ireland and Terry Kingston getting um, injured in, the, in one of the games and Parc de France were playing France and I had to run down and warm up at the side of the field and nearly puked on the side of the field because Gary had been force feeding me jellies for the whole first half. And I just like silly things like that all the way. And, we, and when I went to London in 96, we... Um, uh, Gabriel Fulcher moved in uh, with me and he was playing in London Irish so Gary would come in constantly and so my life pretty much started with um, my love of movie started with those two lads because we, we forever looked through every single movie watched it four or five times became total geeks for the ins and outs of all the big mafia movies back in the day and it was just fun always it was just always energy and then he joined Quinn's um, from, from London Irish he'd wear my jersey I'd wear his, he'd be getting a bollocking um, and he'd say he, he really loved wearing my jersey because they didn't give out to me as much as they give out to him so uh, it just um, it, we spent a huge amount of time together so nice. um, as families we did always and they, and they moved over to uh, to Ross Gray over the last few years, and he took up as housemaster in Ross Gray College, um, so that's only forty minutes away. So again, it was great to see them all again. I haven't seen Bentley in a while, but I'd seen Leone and Lenke, and of course Carl, and um, and they they zip down on his motorbike, call in for tea, and um, uh, and we hadn't seen them obviously since since lockdown, but we saw them before Christmas, before the lockdown, before Christmas, and you know it was great because we were getting to see him every couple of months now, and it's just a shame. It's a shame for you think there's an awful lot more life to live, and he doesn't get that chance. And I think Poppy said it in there about you know, get get-togethers again. Well, we we'll have them without him, which is the shame. Um, but he'll always be remembered within it. And today has been interesting, and my phone has been going constantly for guys from all the way around the world that people that would have known him would have a soft spot for him, guys he played with and against. Um, and it's just been, 
Um, it's been interesting because he doesn't get the the sort of recognition that all the players would give him, and uh, they where they would hold him in their hearts. And um, it's partly because he he worked like he was a, such a worker. So he worked from school to school. I used to, I slagged him. Look, our whole relationship was slagging, so I slagged him constantly. Uh, he slagged me back constantly. Um, I described him as my hero recently, and he thought I was taking the, the, the mickey out of him. Um, but he had literally done everything he could and went to all the great schools, taught in the great schools, uh, rugby, housemaster, all the best things he could possibly do for his kids and did a fantastic job with them. So he was in the Oratory in Reading, he was in Christ College in Brecon, and then back over here to give them a flavour of Ireland, you know. So, um, yeah, look, it's just... He had too much joy, life, energy for, for it to suddenly be extinguished today. So it's, it is very sad. Right. I didn't realise you were that close. It's, it's far more of a friendship than a teammate. Yeah, I mean, we were teammates. Of course we were. And, uh, and we played in, in Quinns together, which was, like, it's just wonderful. And um, it's, it's funny, Golub was, was talking about the, the sense of what you need. You always need a joker in the team. And you always need... Um, a guy who put a smile on your face because you can't feel the weight of a loss. And in Ireland in the 90s, we were losing all the time. For times in Quinns, we had a couple of bad years. You have a guy that can suddenly lift the mood of everybody within five minutes was was fantastic. Um, but we were we were like constantly in and around each other while I was in London because I was living there. I, him and Simon Gagan and Jim Staples were all thick as thieves. Uh, Frano, um, who um, the guys just legging off there, Frano and himself were unbelievably close, and um, and he'd always keep uh, keep in touch, and he was great, great friends with Gabriel Fulcher. So um, again, that was one of the calls Gabriel lives in, in in Canada, and trying to make certain that he knew before reading it on on the news or something this morning became important. But um, and the guys were talking about him in in rugby. He was so fast for such a big man. His hit in the scrum was incredible because he was a power athlete. Mm. And I have a feeling he won the, the Senior World Championships two or three years ago. I think I have that in my head that he won it. He said he did anyway if, if he hadn't. <laughs> and, but no, I think he did. Um, but um, no, I, I, I have a hundred memories of him. I'm, I'm bald because of Gary, not because I wanted to follow, follow him. But he shaved my hair off for the first time and he kind of went whoops as he shaved the big line down the centre of my head. Well, we can't stop there. We have to get the rest of it off. So, um, I mean, he was just, there was a huge amount of fun with it. Like, we often got mistaken for each other. Um, my wedding photograph, uh, so he was at my wedding um, when we got married in England in, in Oakham. And the, the front page of the Rutland Times was a picture of Gary Halpin. And they thought it was me. So... <laughs> We had that forever, and it was, um, you know, it's just, it was always great. It was always great fun. I mean, I just, I have loads of stories. I, I have a video I need to try and find and send it to them. I've been trying to catch a chicken in my garden. It was about the funniest thing I've ever seen. We were all sitting on the ground crying, watching him, because he was, look, he brought joy wherever he was. That's that's for certain. Yeah, I mean, that's a... Hell of a tribute all on its own, isn't it? I was, uh, John O'Sullivan in the Irish Times was writing about him today and he was talking about Halpin, the teacher as well, you know, and, and John writes that his pupils were intrigued to know that Halpin featured in John Olomu Rugby, PlayStation's first ever rugby game. And Gary admitted, interestingly, and the kids showed this to me, one of the hardest things in the game is to try and get me to score a try. They've had various competitions to try and get me over the line. If they manage it and they have proof on replay, I gave them a present. Uh, I suspect, I suspect he was a nice teacher. Uh, look, sure, he's he was just a barrel of fun. So, and it didn't matter where he was, you'd all you'd always get a phone call. Um, um, you need to come and talk to the kids, or will you bring somebody else to talk to the kids? Or it didn't matter what school he was in, we'd end up going down there, you know. And and everybody would do it immediately. The second you were asked by Gary, you would go and do it because like, he was never really looking for anything, and it was just his joy of. Uh, I think the joy of seeing young kids kind of grow up and uh, compete in sports and all that sort of stuff was just part of what he was and part of what Carl was. 
and um, like they've they've worked together for for quite a while. And Carl is also um, teaching in Ross Gray, you know, and um, and she was a cracking athlete in 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 her day. So look, there was always a sense of sport and a sense of teaching. That was that was what he was about. Mm. He was a class act. And um, like I love, I love the crack we used to have with the kids. So, um, and we again, you don't see them as much as as you do, and you're you're growing up, and you have to try and bring up your own kids and everything. And it's where you interact and when you can. And it just, I think for me, it just shows, and that's why it makes it so hard in COVID that you can't be giving them a big bear hug, and you can't, um, like you can't go to the funeral, and you, you you're trying to figure out what's the appropriate thing to do, and. I mean, the appropriate thing to do is to talk about him and um, and and to miss him and to talk to the family, you know, whenever you can and pick up the phone whenever you can. So it's look, I, I it's it's hard. I just think there's a, there's just a large Gary sized hole in the world after it, you know. Mm. Well, look, condolences to all. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm sure it's not a lot of fun to come on today and talk about it, but thanks very much. Yeah, cheers, John. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new.